The world we live in is a facade. Underneath the surface lies the firmament of truth. At the intersection of hidden ascended masters and magical adepts is obsession. Soon the cosmos will die and be reborn. Next time around, the world might be a terrible place or it could be paradise. Someone gets to decide, might as well be you. When belief is power and you want to change the world, you better be the one bringing the fork table. Welcome to Unknown Armies on Warpal Tales. I am Eric at Maroon Recluse on Twitter and your game's master for this terrifying tale series that continues with our current storyline, You. Due to the mature themes of horror and violence explored in our tale, we encourage your listener discretion. We are Warpal Tales and we play a wide assortment of games seven days a week that fall into two categories, Awesome Adventures and Terrifying Tales. Be sure to check the calendar on VorpalTales.com to stay up to date with all of our shows. In the way of shoutouts this month, uh, Tabletop Titties is a queer and feminist TTRPG podcast and streaming group run entirely by people of marginalized genders. Their second season of their D&D show, Into the Revelia, follows our heroes from season one as they take on Hit Point Press's hilarious horror carnival module, Tekna. Every Tuesday, live at twitch.tv slash tabletop titties at 7 p.m. Pacific time, starting June 1st, and in edited podcast form every Friday. Their second show, Titties by Night, is a Vampire the Masquerade V5 show starring a coppery of supernatural investigators as they solve mysteries in Victorian London. Catch all the vampiric action Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. Pacific on Twitch and in podcast form on Saturdays. For more information, visit tabletoptitties.com. And remember, every time we say titties, it's with double Ds. This month, uh, we are taking donations still to support Love Your Rebellion. Love Your Rebellion is a charity organization composed of fantastic people who do amazing work uh, supporting marginalized groups through the arts. We are adding incentives all month long for all of our live plays. Among these reward tiers are the minor and major tables of chaos. That's right, donate to a great charity for a great cause and generate massive amounts of chaos in our games. Also, we have a set of milestones we are still striving to reach daily. Uh, so be, be sure to keep, in, uh, keep track of those in our uh, Twitch chat whenever you can. Uh, on July 23rd, we will be running two back-to-back -back one shots as part of our fundraising efforts with a variety of guest players, beginning with Blue Rose, GM by our, our, our very own Stolen Fires, and Extreme Meat Punks Forever by Voodoo Arcade. Give generously and if and when you can and enjoy all the wonderful rewards. Check out Atlas's Games suite of tabletop RPGs and board games on atlas-games.com where you can get a physical or digital copy of awesome games like Honor and Armies. Remember to follow Portable Tales on Twitch. Visit our website to join uh, the Discord using the link. We are on most social media outlets, including YouTube, where you can catch up on previous episodes. So remember to follow, subscribe, and hit the little bell to get all the updates. Vorpal Tales is also on drive through RPG, by the way. Check out some of our very own Vorpal Tales segments that include characters, monsters, and scenarios made for many of the games that we play weekly. We want to thank Atlas Games for making awesome games for us to play and providing support for their players. Special shout-outs go to Nocturnum, spelled N-C-T-R-N-M, for the use of their song Driveway Mix 2. Also to Least Upperbound and Repulsive Sound for their tracks. Check out some more awesome tunes at nocturnum.bandcamp.com, secretpress.bandcamp.com, as well as on YouTube, Instagram, and SoundCloud under Repulsive Sound. Also, a very special thanks for our current uh, resident rock stars at Nate Mid and our producer Corey uh, for helping to design our awesome character sheets for Astral. And last but not least, a warm thanks to our listeners and fans for tuning in. Our adepts and avatars of the underground are here and ready to bring their fork to the table. Players, Tell our audience who you are, where they can find you online, and who you will be playing this afternoon. Beginning with uh, Key. Hello, I am Key Sama. You can find me on Twitter at Tricky Sama. And today I will be playing Lucius. Alright, and uh, Alan. 
Hey guys, I'm Alan. You can find me on Twitter and Twitch as the Eldritch Keeper, and today I'll be playing Damien Darkwood. Yes. Yes, yeah, And uh, John. Uh, I will be reprising my role as Mr. Sean Krogan Ford. And uh, yeah, you can find me online everywhere at J3 Billion. Nice. Uh, Mike? Hey everybody, uh, I'm Mike Weaver. Uh, today I'll be playing Jace. You can find me online at, doc at Dr. Fusion with the Z, F U Z I O N. And Corey. Hey, I'm Corey, aka Narf on the interwebs. Uh, and it, I will be playing today Jesse, the Mechanomancer and. Yeah, Automaton. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, now for a very short recap on the previous session. Previously escaping the bombardment of Belmont, New Hampshire by the National Guard, our cabal stopped at a McDonald's where they ordered food from the gir a girl at the counter with obscuring black hair and who spoke only through harsh whispers. It was creepy. Battered and bruised from leaving a car at 60 miles per hour, Damien hobbled his way in just as the freak blizzard rolled into the area, forcing everyone to stay indoors. Before the storm cut off their reception, however, the team decided to call Marsha for help. An hour later, she appeared through a maintenance door in the back with Gus and a scruffy-looking man named Jace in tow. Gus gets uh, filled in on what happened in Belmont. He deduces that Frank Gordon wants to open a rift into the veil, unleashing all of its trapped souls, slowing the ascensions and thus stopping the end of the world. Jace orders coffee and puts vodka into it as Gus selects Alex to call the clergy and schedule an emergency meeting. First, however, the comp day will need all of the available phones and all the lights inside the building to be turned off. Damien uses his magic to cause a very likely power outage. Sean stops the employees from using the backup generators for five minutes, lights out. A multitude of voices from the void speak as one rooms strewn with ringing phones and strange markings scribbled on napkins. The clergy agrees to meet where Gus usually meets them every year or so in Miami at a place called the Bon Ton. Needing to charge his chaos magic back up, Davian braved a blizzard and walked into a bar. He met the largest patron there. He bet the, <laughs> the largest patron there $100 to knock out the another large guy who supposedly called him a pussy. The trick worked, and the two men start a bar fight with four people. One of them gets stabbed with a broken bottle before the fight could be broken up. Uh, all charged up, Damon re re rejoins the group, and they travel to Miami, switching off drivers and stopping only to eat and gas up. It's a 23-hour drive down I-95. Along the way, Sean and Damien go into a Piggly Wiggly. Sean tells Damien that he confines in him, uh, that he wants it to find his son and end the person who took him. Damien tells him that he has his back. When Sean says something to the effect of the world can fuck off, can, can fuck itself, as long as he has his son back, he almost immediately falls to the ground and his body goes into convulsions. When next he awakens, Frank Gordon's words flow through his, uh, his voice. Frank laments that they abandoned William to his own fate and that he wanted to have another sit-down talk with his son. He warns Damien this time to find out Gus's real name and give it to him by the next time they speak, or else Jackson dies. Sean, in Frank's body, breaks his own hand when arriving in what appears to be, at first to be some sort of kind, some kind of bunker. A man wearing an America First hat looks in and laughs as he sees Frank Gordon breaking his own hand. Landing back in his own body, the pair leave and Damien asks Gus why Frank would want to know his true name. Realizing what game his enemy is playing, Gus dodges the question and simply states that no life is worth uh, gifting someone like Frank Gordon his true name and leaves it at that. They discuss ways they could find or disrupt the Annihilomancer's plans. Gus warns them that finding him now could be a mistake, as he is clearly not alone in his mad crusade. He goes on to explain that what they experienced at Belmont was the result of an old-school magic, Thanatomancy. Frank has a death mage working with him, and one apparently powerful enough to flood an entire town with souls from beyond the veil. Gus offers instead to teach them how to create a proxy, 
of their own for Jackson. Find him and they, and they find Frank Gordon. Think it over. We have a long ride down to Miami, he says. Jace asks Sean what he remembers from being in Frank's body for that short time. They're able to piece together that he must be residing in a bunker somewhere, possibly in a northwestern state and on, with a militia of some kind. Arriving in Miami, Gus uses Alex again to contact the clergy inside the abandoned Bonton building in the equally desolate shopping plaza. Sean, realizing how Damien's magic works, goes to a nearby pawn shop and walks out with a revolver. Various people leave the Bonton, leave many in different outfits outside the current time. One is a little girl skipping along, and another is a woman in Victorian-era garb. Jace is reminded of his dead mother when he sees the woman. The little girl puzzles over the van and the people inside it, waving and smiling. The doting woman ushers her back inside, but not before Jace reaches out to her. Mom? Realizing she's been mistaken as someone's mother, the woman touches Jace and is suddenly channeling the deceased spirit of his mother. She tells him to never summon or allow someone to summon them into the real world from their side, else the cruel ones can arrive and destroy anything in their path in order to retrieve them back to the veil. The woman comes out of the possession and apologizes to Jace for the loss of his mother at such a young age, where she excuses herself and goes back inside. Overcome with catharsis at finally being able to talk to his mother since he, she died 20 years ago, Jace is overcome and sits down sobbing. Sean's back with a revolver, and it's time for Damien and him to play Russian roulette. One round in the chamber, Sean goes first. Click. Damien spins the barrel twice and goes next. Click. Having won this round of Chance Against the Universe, Damien is charged enough that he believes he can use his chaos magic to find Sean's son, Jackson. Finished with his deal making, the clergy disappears inside the Bonton in a flash of lights and wind. Gus and the clergy have an accord now. The clergy, it seems, has detected a newly emerging archetype in Miami. Apparently, it's causing the disappearance of young children from nearby homeless shelters. They don't want it gaining more power than it currently has. Part of his deal with them involves removing this archetype. He doesn't mention what his side of the bargain will be, however. He gave Jace a key and an address, instructing them to meet him at his old house later in the evening. They're free to crash there and get rested before they get to work the next day. Meanwhile, Gus was going to take a walk and see how to find and combat Frank now that he knows what his plan is. At the old house in Coral Gables, Damien uses a significant charge to ask the universe where Jackson is located. A lucky Google search shows him to be located at a former national park in Wyoming, one that was privatized and later sold to some groups who bought out the land and allocated part of its ground as private property. Jesse keeps hearing a dog running around in the backyard of the house, but doesn't see one. He records the sound of the animal and plays it back. Somehow he captures the audio from the past. Something happened at this house. He hears Gus's voice in the background calling for Lucifer to heal. Growling and burrowing sounds emerge from underneath the gazebo. He investigates the sound and discovers a small amount of dirt, putting a digger bot to work. It reveals a metal strong box. Inside are letters and journals written by Gus in his handwriting about him and his family. That's where we left off. All right. So everybody's more or less back on back at the house. Uh, the only person missing, of course, is Gus, who is supposed to meet you later on this evening. Um, Alex is sort of keeping to herself ever since the incident that took place recently at the Bonton. It's still the middle of the afternoon, um, and Jesse just seemed to have found a, a strong box buried in the backyard underneath the gazebo. Jesse, what do you want to do with that information? Sorry, I was muted in two places. No um, so this has uh, Gus's true name. You see, uh, it's so, just flitting through the the papers. It it shows like a a name that doesn't match with Gustavo uh, or Gus. But when mm. you look, you see. And it's it's addressed some of the letters are not just from him but also from his wife to him like they're old like love letters or whatever and this one in particular addresses you see one of the at the top addresses him under a different name i'll show you which one that is here in just a second Let's 
This is the name that you see listed. You can share or keep that to yourself. Um, but you see that there's a series of different letters there um, written by him. Some are recent, some are very old. Did, um, I'm wondering if Jesse overheard the fact that, like, the true name conversation, I think that was, we were just, like, standing outside the cars, right? Like, that, uh, the that Frank wants his true name in order to save Jackson? Yeah, you heard that when uh, both Damien and Sean came back from the Piggly Wiggly. And Sean had been possessed, apparently, and that's when Damien was like, why does he want your true name? And he didn't say why. He was just like, let's just say we shouldn't give it to him, because <laughs> that, that would be really bad. Well, I'm going to assume that someone's true name isn't necessarily the name that's written on their driver's license, either. No, in this particular case, it doesn't seem to be uh, like a legal yeah. name or anything like that. Uh, this is like his true name. Like this is only this is the name that only very people who are very close to him know. Mm -hmm. and this apparently was uh, was referred to by his his late wife. Like a nickname, yeah. All right. right. Um, I might keep that piece of information just in my pocket at the moment, but show them okay. the rest of the correspondence and stuff that I found because it's interesting. To see some you history of Gus. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's still daytime, so Gus is not supposed to be due back until much later in the evening. Um, do you like, do any of you find this interesting at all when you see oh, uh, yes. Jesse come back in and it's like, hey, I found letters here that belong to Gus? Like, <laughs> yeah. The whole I'd, box full of them. I'd want to take letters a look and journal there. entries and stuff. You want to take one? All right. Or take, just take a look and. I'm going to give each of you, those of you who are interested, one to read from. Assuming there's at least three of you that want to read one, I'll give you a short entry, each of you, that you can read out loud. Yeah. Uh, let me give the first one here. And I'll give the first one to, or to Sean. Second. You can start us off, John. Excellent. <clears throat> I have to get my uh, reading voice on. You understand. <laughs> I understand. It's fine. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, apparently, this is numero uno. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since I've written to you, and for that, I'm sorry. Been busy dealing with the usual nonsense here. I trust you and the kids are doing well. This job has taken longer than expected, but I think we should get it wrapped up before the holidays hit home. This new guy, Frank, seems to be catching on really fast. I'm thinking he'll be ready by year's end. Maybe I can convince the clergy to take him on full time. Maybe we'll finally be able to live together in peace for once. Imagine that. Give Lucy and the kids a squeeze. I'll be home in time for turkey. Gustavo. Dr. Fusion, you have number two. I do. Yeah. Uh, that's good. And the third one belongs to Corey. You can go next to the Discord message. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just like okay, I have it. Excellent. I should be used to this by now. Despite all that I've lost in the countless lifetimes that came before. However, this time it's different. I really thought we had a chance. I guess we're both cursed, aren't we? Pretty sure I know who's responsible, too. I think they sent one of theirs to punish me. How did he get past Lucifer, however? Please tell me you didn't let him into our house. I can see him knocking on the door and giving you some sob story about his car broke down the way. You are always kind to strangers. One of the more endearing things about you. 
I miss you, Dolores. You and little Sid. Tanya. You're better off this way without me. If their killer had failed, the next thing would have been a hundred times worse. They're petty that way. Don't worry. They'll get theirs. They always do. As for your stranger, I took care of him. He came here thinking he was going to ascend, to become a god, to live forever, since that's the deal he probably cut with the clergy. I let him have a taste. I gave him countless lifetimes worth of pain and loss and death. I gave him all of it. When I was finished with him, I felt as if I had granted him a mercy. If I was fair, I would have kept your killer in the state I had left him in, just a frightened, babbling madman with mountains of memories that were not his own. Memories of worlds that existed, ended, and were reborn again. I fed the bastard to Lucifer. Good night, my loves. G. All right, Corey, you're next. I cleared my voice with the mute button on. <laughs> Hello again. It's been a long time. Not really sure what I'm doing here digging up these old memories again. Some things you just can't let go, right? They're a part of you. Make you who you are. Anyhow, I'm not the same person I was back then. Probably for the best. Maybe next time around I'll be a different person too. Maybe we both will. Made a huge mistake with the kid and the clergy. I'm working on it. I've got a plan this time. Been tooling around with it for a while. You know me. Always fixing one thing or another. Tinkering with reality. Time's almost up. Be seeing you soon. And it looks like, it, like a, the number 8, but it's like the little infinity yeah. symbol. That's what you get when you look at the... Uh, those are the ones that stand out to you the most. And then, of course, there was a, like an old love letter that you uh, that caught your eye, Jesse, between uh, Dolores and uh, the Comte that reveals his, his supposed true name. Um, can you send me the rest of that letter, if you had it? Or is it just... Uh, those are the three parts. Okay. Uh, those are the only three, yeah. There's all yeah, there's all sorts of stuff in there that talks about. I mean, him. the one piece that I kept aside. I didn't know if there was anything already written for it, or if you just had the name. Oh yeah, no, that was just the name. Okay. That was just the. I didn't have anything else. Yeah, cool. I'm terrible at writing love letters. What can I say? <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, that's what you have uh, based on based on what you're able to uncover about the the Comte's. Um, journals and the different letters that he wrote through time you know throughout time that some of them are dated like as as far back as like the 1950s which is probably around how long the this house has been here yeah you know jesse we probably should put these back i don't think i don't think we should have these my experience with gus has, you know not been all that much but enough to know that um i don't want to upset him I mean, I can put them back where we found them. He's likely going to know we've disturbed them too, or we can just give them to him and say, "Hey, I think these are yours. We didn't want to. We don't want them to get them to fall in the wrong hands. You know, yeah, play it up that play it up that way." I think that's the better course of action. Is like, I heard a dog <clears throat> digging underneath your gazebo, and I found this. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you see, Alex is like ever the privacy uh, proponent. It's like we shouldn't be even reading those. Those are private. It's like that we should just put them back where you found them. Don't even mention it to Gus if he shows up. That's what she says. You don't have he's, to do he's gonna says. know that you've touched them. You can always destroy them. them. That's kind of Gus's that's, call, I think. That's worse. I rolled a secret. That's much by the worse. Way. Um, okay, so let's let's idea. plan that scenario through. Let's talk that one through here for a moment. We have letters. These letters we know that Gus is going to know that we have touched them. We are the only ones in the house and all of a sudden they end up burnt. That's a bad look. That's that's a really bad look for an extra dimensional being who can melt your mind with a look. Literally with his eyes. You are 100% correct, Sean. I, I, I really think that just saying these are yours, here you go. Um, we don't, we don't 
We don't know what to do with them. We want to make sure you decide what you want to do with those. And if he wants to burn them, great. If he doesn't, that even better. Okay. And I hopefully mean, he may look upon us favorably. I mean, I I like that idea, but let's talk about the kind of narrative these. Let's talk about the narrative here. Like he restart, he helps in restarting the university over and over again, and he relives what his same. The, the same love over and over again, the same relationship, or he just or writes her letters, something. or he just writes her letters. You know, they, uh, for the the comp that he often sees the same faces uh, when the world uh, begins over again, uh, but a lot of times those same people are not the same person because different circumstances and what have you, different uh, alternate histories and what have you. Like it's never the same thing every time. Not exactly, at least. One of two theories in my this... mind is either he's writing these letters to an older version of his love that no longer exists, um, maybe recycled in a previous world, you know, along with all the old letters. But... So Damien oh. picks up the letters and looks at them and just folds them and goes like, yep. It's a pretty good definition of hell. And throws them down. Can't yep. really imagine what the hell Gus is going through. This is hell for it. It's like for anybody, this is horrible. Uh, they always say living forever is a curse. This is proof of it. You're hundred percent right. Uh can we talk about the more interesting bit of that though? Which part? I'm pretty sure. Frank is the kid in the clergy that Gus was making a deal with. Well, it sounded at, like he was training him. And at one point, Frank was Gus's out. student. It seems like maybe Gus wanted to replace himself. I don't know. And then Frank went rogue. I mean, that's a, that's a very good assumption. I mean, who knows with all the things that we've seen, how long would you keep your sanity if you were given, you know, the choice to remake the world? Do Fuck, you... I don't know if I'm sane right now. I've been through this shit once. Fucking once. Corruption is pretty deep. About. And to think, that if everything goes to plan for Gus, all of this is just going to keep happening and happening and happening and happening and happening. Just one big system. I mean, the, the man owns a, a house in Florida. He obviously wants to retire. It shows. So, you know, maybe we can help him. Retire to what? What's the next step? The world doesn't get remade. Like what? What the fuck happens then? Well, no, I'm thinking that if he if he he wants off the wheel, like everybody else who gets remade, he's tired. Who wouldn't be? Like like, like Damien said, he's living it's been living through hell for God knows how long. I think I went off the wheel too. I mean, haven't we all been in that been on that bus ride that lasts for two hours? Cause you're stuck in traffic. There's no stops. There's no bathroom. You want to get off. You're done. And in this case, I, th I think he's hit that point. Yeah. Or he's... Anyone here can roll notice or connect, whichever is highest for you. Everybody? Anybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. All right. Notice. Going for notice. I'm assuming everybody's in the same room in the living room uh, going over these notes. Oh, 16 on my notice roll. Nice. Wow, three. Oh, Whoa. three. Badass. Okay. Um, I just spent a good roll today. <laughs> you, you noticed that Alex, after she said, like, we should be looking at that, like, that's private business. We should just put it back and don't even mention it to him or whatever. Like, as soon as you start talking about Frank and the clergy and stuff like that, she gets up and walks out. I'm going to go follow her. I, I have a question, Eric. Yeah. Um, so I rolled my secrets to kind of try to keep the fact that I was not showing all of the letters 
Mm. Um, and I got a 28 on that, so I'm wondering if any of the notice rolls they just made would be, like... Alright. No. Cool. No. Uh, yeah, you did. You rolled it really well. Um, yeah, you noticed... Uh, Damien was... was, no, was that, that was specifically to notice some other mm -hmm. stuff that was going on in the room, with Alex specifically. Uh, yeah, she just gets up and... and kind of holds her, hand, her arms and she walks out of the room. She seems to be going into the uh, hallway adjacent to the main living room that kind of shoots down and then splits off into the different rooms. So she moves away, but what does body language tell me? She's uncomfortable about this subject matter. I don't make a big deal out of it because Alex is very emotionally like since the beginning she can't handle stuff well so it doesn't really they've been through a lot yeah. doesn't ring a bell or it uh, doesn't raise a red flag or anything that she's just leaving she's like okay whatever yeah as soon as this conversation turns to that like she gets this look on her face and gets up and walks out anybody else who made the role also notices this kind of glad i don't <laughs> Excellent. So you uh, you have some time before Gus gets back home uh, for the evening. Uh, what did you want to do? You're basically left to your own devices for right now and just kind of relax, rest up, what have you. Is the dog still making noises in the backyard? No. All right. Look, in my experience, honesty always usually wins. So, you know, just give Gus his letters. Tell him we, we actually saw them. He's not going to do anything. He's not going to blow a gasket Send him out to meet me in the backyard when he gets home. All right. All right. I think we can do that. Yeah, so I mean, Alex? He's like, he's like this super cosmic repairman entity. I don't think, you know, you can't lie to him. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you could lie to him, but, you know, that's, that's going to go extremely well. Well, I don't think he's going to do anything because he needs us. But emotionally wise, like that might bring you know up that... some old feelings that he, maybe he doesn't want to revisit. Yeah, that's that's a strike you don't want held against you eventually. I think we'll get held against you eventually. Uh, you have a so, couple yeah. of rooms that you can uh, stay in while you're at the house. Uh, you know, as you're setting your stuff down and everything. Uh, Is the house furnished? No, at all or is very, it empty? very sparsely there's like a okay. couch there's like a small little dinner table stuck in a corner a couple chairs nothing really special um there is a master bedroom and there's just like uh the, the old bed is there uh there the, the kids room the one for the boy and one for the girl right across from one another in the hallway in the same hallway as the master bedroom where uh alex was walking down towards uh, they are a lot of the stuff is missing from there all that's there is like a bed like a little cot you know what i mean uh, like a, if what time is it? I take a look at my watch. Late afternoon, probably like three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Nah, doesn't matter. Uh, I, I open the food. fridge and I check if we have any bread, eggs, and milk. There is some in there, but it's expired. Ah, uh, <laughs> no French toasts. <laughs> like for this, the little Cuban bodega, like right down the street. <laughs> you could probably go to if you wanted to get something for the food. I think Sean, um, he just kind of wants to go and he's going to like start walking just around the block. Sure. Let me get some stairs. I mean, this is a hoity-toity kind of neighborhood and you are who you are and you're walking around and people kind of give you the glance like as they're watering their, their, their lawns or whatever. And some people say hello or wave and others just kind of like turn your back on you and walk back inside. Um, Anybody looks at me, I just smile and wave. Yeah. You're fine. <laughs> looks at me weird. Hi. You take a walk around I'm your the block neighbor and, now. Yeah. Uh, you take a walk around the block and you can't help think about Jackson because you see a pair of kids like riding in, on bikes and you see one uh, one kid, a couple of them like running around on the, on the front lawn or whatever with super soakers and shit. You can't think, you can't help but think about that. It's that's the top of your mind. It's your obsession. 
at this point, I would I would gather to say. I'm gonna go and like not try and be creepy. But I'm gonna go like four or five houses down and just sit on the curb for a while. Sure. And just be and, and just kind of like think on Jackson and like it's how how fucked the situation is like if i succeed he dies if i fail he dies yeah how long do you stay on the curb Just so I, get I have i have my cell phone on me until someone calls me okay you're there for a little while um Eventually, the police uh, cruiser comes by, and they just kind of go around, around once around the neighborhood. And then the second time they come around, they see you and like, "Hey, buddy, how's it going?" Uh, yeah, I just need some air, officer. I'll be on my way. All right, you live here? Uh, around, around the ways over there. I'm staying at a friend's house. Oh, welcome to the neighborhood. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. It's either they kind of. Nah, I'll get up. To, kind of dust you get, myself you get up off. And walking off. Okay. They, they they kind of pull off to the side, and they seem to be just like looking at reports or taking phone calls over, and they just watch you walk away. Yeah, yeah. As as police officers are like to do. Of course. <laughs> to the suspicious suspicious they're your, person. They're just here to protect out. and serve, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Which one of uh, which room do you want to claim back at the house, Lucius? Ah, uh, hmm. How many rooms are there again? There's the master bedroom. There's the, the son's room, the daughter's room, all sparsely furnished. And then there's mm. the guest room. Mm. Four rooms for five people. Lucius will be sleeping in the living room. <laughs> that's his couch, choice. Right? No bedrooms. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Alex takes one of the, the smaller rooms because she has a small frame. She's short, so she takes like the girls' room or something like that, or the boys' room. Um, Damien, which room do you, you want to claim for yourself? Run by the, the rooms again? The master bedroom, uh, the boys' room, the girls' room, and the guest room. Lucius has already claimed the couch. I'll take the master's bathroom if no one cares sure make yourself at home you go in and you lay down on the bed you're like oh this is comfy uh there it's a, there's a two bathrooms in this house one is right in the hallway just outside the master bedroom and then there's the, the adjoining bathroom that's part of the master bedroom you lay down and you hear like sounds coming from the bed from the bathroom the door is already ajar uh you kind of it's it's a weird sort of scratching sound like a shh, shh, shh. and you kind of lean up for a second you look and you, you kind of blink for a second there's a woman in a bathrobe uh combing her hair in the mirror looks like she just got out of the shower she looks at you in the in the reflection for a moment and makes eye contact with you dark hair light eyes what do you oh, do oh wow Am I having like am I having like backseat chick flashbacks? You don't know. But does Oh no, this she... doesn't look like the backseat lady. <laughs> I'm surprised you remember that though. Wow. <laughs> Cuz that would have been super creepy. It is um, kind of creepy though because the, you know at that point you were looking back at her through the rear view through a mirror and now this this woman's looking at you through the uh the reflection in the bathroom mirror. All like right, I'm, I'm, look, with, with all the crap that's been happening to us, I'm not that surprised. But I am on guard, and I'm like, can I help you? See, she kind of like, she hears you talking, and the door just goes <laughs> slam shut in the, in the bathroom. Wow. General house call. Everybody in the living room as I go down to the living room. <laughs> Uh, Jace, what, which room are you taking? Actually, Jace takes a seat at the dining room table and pulls out a pack of cards and starts playing solitaire. <laughs> and uh, he's not really playing solitaire to play solitaire. He's, he's practicing his fortune telling, using his luck to, to get ideas. It's, it's, it doesn't really work for him very well, but Gus told him originally mm -hmm. just to work on that kind of stuff. 
to yeah. affect probability, and so he's trying to do that, but he's not very good at it. He's just taking notes for his next comedy set because, <laughs> let's face it, what they've been going through the past, past 24 hours is there's a story in this somewhere. Oh, yeah, or, no doubt. Notes about, Russian, be... notes about Russian roulette. Would he be visible from the living room? Uh, yeah, actually, the living room is a one big open space. Uh, so, like, you're on the couch, and then he's in the corner of that same long rectangular space. And he's at the table just playing cards, you know, taking notes. <laughs> Lucius would get up from the couch and go over, pull up a chair near him, sit down. So, what's your deal? <laughs> um, currently, I have I have two kings and a queen in my hand. Yeah? yeah. Okay, what's... Uh, the, the shitty solitaire hand. Uh, <laughs> me? No, I, I, I mean, what's my deal? That, that's, that's kind of a loaded question. Maybe we're going to start with something a little lighter. What's your favorite color? Uh, well, looks at his shirt, which is blue. I'm thinking blue. All right, what's your deal? Ah, you just did it. I can appreciate that. Smart ass. You him <laughs> well. No, uh, I've worked for Gus for a short time. He says I'm um, lucky. Mm -hmm. And I'm important that way, apparently, so... Although I don't think I'm lucky at all. Can't get a job. Can't even get applause at a, at a show. So, you know, whatever. Hmm. This gig pays in keeping me alive. Yeah. Not sleeping with cockroaches, so I guess it works out. Yeah. What about you? What's your deal, since you like to ask those kind of questions? Uh, well, used to uh, work at a bar. And then this happened. Now I'm uh, trying to pick up all the pieces. Pieces of the bar? Pieces of your life? Pieces of eight? Pieces of my life. Yeah, that's always a rotten deal. Yeah. Now that's the thing. You fall in with this kind of crowd. Um, you don't have a life anymore. You might as well mm. just not keep picking it up because it's just not worth it. I mean, that's what Gus told me, at least. So, And after seeing what I just saw, I'm pretty much sure he's 100% correct about that. But is he? I don't know. I, I, I trust him as far as you can trust any supernatural entity who, has, who holds your life in the palm of his hand. So, um, really, um, he's been nice to me, actually, for who he is. But uh, he's, he's getting older, and that worries me. I don't know why. I just I feel worried when I, every time I see him, he seems just a little bit older. Yeah. And now, with this whole tracking down Sean's son, I. I don't know what to tell you. Mm. Everyone in this room, Gus trusts, so I trust them innately. That's the best thing you can best thing you can take away from this. I mean, you've seen you've seen him work with Damien. Yeah, the man's a a big pile of chaos, like a loaded gun. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate that. Gus, if Gus trusts him, I'm 100 percent behind who he is. Yeah, I'm Lucius, by the way. Jace, he actually shakes your hand. Yeah, his hand is cold and sweaty. <laughs> cold and clammy. All right. Uh. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Lucius pulls back, smiles, nods, and like underneath the table is wiping his hand off on his pants. <laughs> well, nice. nice talking to you. Mm, uh, sure, same. Jesse, uh, does Jesse claim a room for himself, or are they just staying outside? They don't have to sleep, not really. I, yeah, I was going to claim the gazebo. So it works for me. It's just you, Lucifer, and the uh, the tree ant back there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and now this little digging robot. Oh yeah, the, the yeah yeah Mr. digs. Um, I think that just leaves uh, Sean then. Uh, Sean. I am working on a outside. thing while I'm out there though. I'm well, writing. I'm writing? writing down everything I know about Jackson. Everything that ah. Sean has ever said. Um, I feel like the plan is that we're going to try to create a proxy for Jackson. 
And I can literally create a proxy for Jackson? You really can. So, uh, I'm going to offer that to Gus when Gus gets home as, like, an idea. And, and sure. give him back his stuff. Makes sense. Um, around this time, I think, uh, Damien comes running out of the, the master bed. I'm like, guys, we got to have a meeting right now. <laughs> meeting time. We can Sean is, like, coming in from outside at this point. Like, oh, okay, let me walk away from the cops. <laughs> oh, and, and, and if he's not happen. back, I'm sending a message. The I text message Sean. Get your ass back here ASAP. <laughs> Boom. Look at my phone. Oh, he's so dramatic. Okay. <laughs> Amy, is it dramatic? The guy who did the Russian roulette thing? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> So Sean walks back in just as Damien's coming around the corner, like, okay, we need to have a meeting now. Proceed. Right now, we're we're all here. We are not alone in this house, okay? I just really? saw a lady in the bathroom combing her hair, looking at me weirdly, and just shutting the door without touching it. Like, bang, super, like, poltergeist style. Now, was she just in the mirror? Oh, that's a good question. No, she was like physically there. Well, I mean, she was, Damien, this is Gus's house. What would you expect? Oh, no, I, I, I'm not surprised. I'm just relaying information. Maybe you should pick a different room. That one seems taken. Well, it's the bathroom. Gonna... It's not the room. It's the bathroom. Okay, so That's no one uses the joining. master bathroom. That one seems to what, what are you doing sleeping in the bathroom? I'm not <laughs> sleeping in the bathroom. Sean, come on. Okay, <laughs> so, fair. Fine. So, no, but the point is that, is that we're not alone. Okay? So we need to, like, keep keep a lookout, keep a watch. What was her know, name? Other. She didn't Dolores. talk. Huh? Dol Dolores? Dolores. It's probably Dolores. And who would that be? The letters? Possibly Gus's departed wife. Jason okay. used to play solitaire while not, when he, not paying attention. All right, all right. So you have a room that you need to pick out, uh, Sean. Which one would you like? Um... I wanted to, uh, like, I think I'm going to hang, especially now that we have a ghost in the house, I'm going to go hang out with Jesse and hopefully, shh, shh, hopefully there is, you know, you know how those uh, porches sometimes come with like the laid in benches, like the, the really old porches where they have like the, the yeah. bench and then there's handrail up there. And, like, he's just going to hang out on, on that. Hopefully, if there's something like that back there, he's just gonna. So you, so you don't even go anywhere near the the rooms. You're just like, I'm gonna no, sit outside I, where, I, the, where the haunted he, dog is. <laughs> he aggressively, he aggressively is like, that's this is a a Friday thing. This is Tuesday. Fuck that thing. I don't care. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, you see, Alex is uh, just gets up and it's like, did you hear noise out here? And you all heard, like, it was sort of like um, she was one of the last ones to come into the, the living room as you called for this meeting. Uh, just prior to that, you thought you heard her or somebody, like, running down the hallway, like, doo -doo 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 -doo, but it sounded like a set of feet, not just one set of feet. And when she comes into the, into the and you heard a door slam after yours did, uh, Damien, and you see Alex walk in, it's like, did anybody hear that? There's a, somebody shut the, slammed the door, and there was like, when he ran into my room. You didn't see anybody run into your room? No. Nope, and the crazy. dog's been pretty quiet in the backyard. I haven't heard him. It's the ghost lady. Oh, obviously. You know, of course, it's supposed be. to be haunted. She, she says, looking around. It's obviously the ghost lady. Okay. I don't know why you're so upset. So, just a quick uh, info I get. Two boosts from T.Y. Yeager. <laughs> it's my buddy, Ty. 
as a quick aside here, I love how we're all so desensitized. We're just like, <laughs> eh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ghosts. Oh, there's been weird. Like, would that yeah. would that reflect the four uh, notches that I have in unnatural? <laughs> Yeah, you've been attacked by magic already. You're just like, okay. So Sean especially, too. He literally had his face melted for a moment. For a hot minute, and he had to cut a, a hole in his own face. Yeah. To breathe. Like, that was an Three. experience. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, this is nothing compared to that. Um, just little interesting tidbits. But, uh, so just all... don't... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Just look at him like... Everything's fine. Just don't piss whatever it is off. I'm going to sleep outside. Have fun. <laughs> I actually have something to oh. talk to you about, Sean. Oh, oh you do? You were yeah, here? If, if, where the, if the meeting is over, when it's just me and Sean in the backyard, unless anyone else is joining us, I'm not really not talking about it around others. I just, you know, don't necessarily want to have the meeting in the house either. Um, but if we're going to be trying to build a proxy for Jackson, um, I could probably make a, another Jackson. Is he out of, is, is he, is Jesse out of ear range? Not intentionally. If you try at all to listen to this conversation, you will hear it. I'm gonna try actively trying when yeah. I, if I pick if I pick up make another Jackson I'm gonna be like what <laughs> so for for John's clarification here the reason Gus asked for a proxy if I wanted to make a proxy with my son was so that I could be more like Sean no the like, uh, because we could use the proxy to find the original. Because any attempt to find, right, like, and that, but that that is what that that is what Frank has on me right now as a proxy. Yes, like what Frank is doing to you in in and uh, William was a proxy effect, and the idea would be that we could doing. create. A proxy to your son. Yeah, what he's what he's apparently still doing. And flip yeah, the so control. Like the, right yeah, so in other words, like Frank has this proxy control over the group as a whole, right? Which mm. includes Sean and William respectively because they have a strong blood bond uh, to one another. But he doesn't have control over Jackson. I mean he does physically, but he doesn't have that proxy doesn't extend to him so what gus sort of offhandedly suggested was maybe you can make a proxy of your son and you can find if you find him you inevitably find your double sean and by that extension you may also find frank gordon and comes with the added benefit of maybe swinging that proxy towards us so I'm just a little bit more like that. <laughs> well, in this particular case, he would be, because of um, Jesse's mechanomancy ability, he could conceivably create life like, a, like in every sense of the word, he can recreate your son out of parts. It's, a, it's Jackson, but he's an automaton. And if he's real enough, you can use him as part of the a proxy ritual to find the quote unquote real Jackson and find him. Which of well, course we, is not gonna have any repercussions at all, uh, hmm. one way or the other, you know, creating a double of your son and using him as a proxy ritual, that's not gonna lead to anything. You know, we have an idea of where he is right now. A generalized idea, sure. And the proxy would give us the ability to pinpoint? To pinpoint him, yeah, you can affect him magically the proxy kind of like how sean uh, excuse me frank is able to affect you all and you wanted to and the reason frank has this over me is get, like it's a teeter-totter right mm -hmm. like the farther away from him i get unless the unless the answer is absolute zero mm -hmm. the more power he has right 
Yeah. If it's absolute zero, then he has nothing. But if he's at one, or am I, if I'm at one and he's at 99, then he has 99 units of bullshit to use against me. <laughs> sort of like that, yeah. Except that it's, it's its own individual skill for him. Like, his proxy control over all of you is, like, double digit high. Um, all right, so if I understand this lower. correctly, it's like the, the closer you are to being like him, the less power he has over you. Well, the more uh, power we have over him. We have over him. Correct. Yeah. Which doesn't necessarily mean he has less power over us, just that we could potentially outweigh that scale and Precisely. Con control him. As Gus said, it gets worse before it gets better, if you go in that direction. If you head in the opposite direction, he, ha he still has more control over you because you're not lessening his control over the proxy. You're lessening your involvement in the proxy by removing yourself from it. So and That's going to take a while, though. What I'm what I'm hearing is his 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 variable stays the same regardless. Unless we adjust we changes. adjust yeah. yeah, we adjust our variable. And like yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk I'll, I'll be like just I'll you know, I'll relay this in real time with Jesse and just have a conversation about it and be like, I mean it's not a bad idea, plus it like I mean, I, I hate it. I fucking hate it. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth. I'll be honest. Creating well, a creating a, creating a, a, a proxy, not not even a proxy, another life form that is my son. And then what? Like, let's let's consider the baseline here. My son sees this boy. Like that's going to fuck with him. Sure, it, that's it yeah, might that's, that's, that's <laughs> it might help explain why there's going to be two of you if there were two of him that's a good that's a good observation actually yeah good point but you're you're missing also that what is it going to do to you sean <laughs> see that part is not occurring to me at all because <laughs> yeah. like, it's fine i'll just forget about it like what? It, yeah. Like I have to. I, I feel like he'd almost be split at that point too. Is like. Well, the interesting. Another interesting thing. Or is he would hate it. We could give the duplicate. That's an interesting additional thought. powers too. Yeah, I mean, it could give you. I mean, yeah, he would be an automaton like Jesse, so. I mean that's that's up to you what you want to do with that. Obviously, I mean, is this still your son? Is this thing going to be a hundred percent, like a hundred percent to find Jackson? Like, do we know that this is going to be an absolute? I mean, You saw you saw what those ladies were willing to do when they realized their purpose was complete. Yeah, you can, you can make them. It's a, it, essentially when you do that mechanically speaking, you create a new character. Yeah. You get two hundred points. Person, you fill yeah. them out. Yeah, like I would just say, them. like create a, a new character sheet and call it Jackson. Give him passions and everything. It's and a major there, creation. Because it's it is a major creation, and it is. Uh, indistinguishable from the real thing. Yeah. Which is why you have Jesse. <laughs> you could even imbue it with the warrior potentially or you know your own uh, skills. You could you could have Jesus. you could have another, you know, fighter with us. That gets that gets into a whole That's other set of uh <laughs> going down. Uh, questionable uh but that might uh, that might make it you know, uh that might make it less effective as a proxy as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're supposed to be exactly like your son. And for that, you'll have artistic freedom. You can say, yeah, you know, Jackson is a standard, right. you know, huge, I'd, whatever. I, first of all, I don't trust Gus. Where, where I can throw him. I don't trust anybody who is attached to any of this bullshit. Uh, save for the people in this house right now. 
Maybe not Jace. I don't know Jace. Um, we're talking about creating another person, though. We're talking about remaking my son as he was. And then what? Just like giving him the power him? to. But what is proxy. he? What, oh, what the? What does he do after it? Like what? Even if he doesn't, like he he doesn't have a purpose. The the women just walked into a a, a building. Like they killed themselves because they didn't have a purpose. Lots imagine of things to consider. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I imagine that just comes down to the will of the creation or the creator. Why? Why am I still around? I don't know my purpose. And then there's the the split, like. Two of me, two of him. I mean, like, we could I mean, probably do this ourselves. We know we know that proxy magic exists. We've heard enough about it. And I believe that I could make something close enough that it could probably control its own proxy without Gus's help. I mean, maybe it would be better with Gus's help. Maybe. But it's a decision that only you can make. Like Sean has and which, decisions which ladies make. and which ladies were you talking about? Uh, the ladies from. Oh, do you not remember they walked into the building? You uh, were there. No. I'm sorry. No, you're you're good. I mean, it was an impressive moment, to say the least. Very heartening, very encouraging in a way. Hmm. At least that's how I saw it. They were incredibly brave. I wish I could remember. Um, <laughs> you forgot, yeah. I mean, I just, I, I just don't like the idea of making another Jackson and then just being done with him. Yeah, what like, how do you even, this? how do you even deal with that afterwards? Like, if you say that I forgot this, it may help you know that that sacrifice would be part of the mojo that powers Jackson. Or the proxy, Jackson. Jackson, not Prime. Uh, Jackson Prime will be Jackson, the original. And uh... <laughs> I almost like Jackson Prime to be the copy, I'll be honest. <laughs> All right. Jackson can be Jackson. All right. Uh, you have I, got, I, ha I have to think about it. I can't. Oh, yeah. Not an easy decision to make. Not for a dad, anyway. Uh, you take some time, you ponder it over in the backyard. Eventually, it starts to get dark. And then a car pulls up. Daddy's home. Oh, it's about time. He's bringing in some stuff from the, the back of his car. He opens up the hatch in the back, and he brings, he brings like boxes full of I, papers and stuff. I go out like and that. give him a hand. Oh. He, he seems surprised. He's like, thank you. Yeah, he's, bring, okay. he's bringing food also. He's bringing like in like local uh, Cuban delicacies and stuff like that, like uh, pastelitos and Cuban bread and uh, hot coffee. He's got like a whole thing of like uh, cafecitos and stuff like that to keep you wired and away for the next 24 hours. <laughs> Plops him down on the little tiny uh, dinner table stuck in the corner in the main living room area. And he's like, um, brought some stuff in. I was looking into Frank Gordon. 
He had a lot of other uh, aliases. I've had this in storage for years, he says, and looks at, he plops down these boxes in the center of the, um, of the living room. And he's going through them and he pulls out this stack like this. <laughs> and he plop, he puts a, a bunch of it on the, the table uh, near where Lucius and uh, Jace are like sitting there playing cards or whatever. And you're just like, what's that? And he's Is like, Jesse in the room? I'm guessing everybody's in the room. Uh, uh, you don't have to be if you don't want to. Uh. So I give Jesse the look of like, do you want to have that letter talk with him? Or are we having that letter talk? I'm like, <laughs> all right, so I'll pick up the letters then. Mm -hmm. If I got a, I got a, mm, and I'm going like, hey, Gus. He seems that he's busy going over through the papers and he's like, this is Frank Gordon's manifesto. He says, and he plops it down on the table and he's like, that in a nutshell is annihilamency. And then he kind All of right. say, hey, uh, and he's like, yeah. And I, I, I give him the letters and I'm like, we found them. Yes, we read them. They're yours. No, oh. oh, we found them. I should have remembered to tell you to stay away from the backyard. Sorry. The dog really wanted me to dig my them own, up. It's my own fault, he says. <laughs> Sorry, what were you saying? I say the dog really wanted me to dig them up. <laughs> I think you mean he wanted to dig them up. I <laughs> really wanted to dig them up. <laughs> also, is it possible that your late wife essence or energy or something is in the house? Because I saw someone in the bathroom upstairs. He nods, he closes his eyes and he nods and he's like, he starts, he takes the letters and he's like flipping through them and stuff. Uh, he walks by the door where like the, uh, the, uh, pictures used to hang on the, on the wall alongside uh, going to, towards the, the front door of the house. And he just kind of like touches the wall with his hand and he kind of leans on it and looks at the letters and he's like, he tosses it onto the, uh, the couch. I imagine you have questions. Things you want to talk to me about? And he goes like this, and he's like, I suppose now's the time. Enjoy the pastelitos, he says. He points to the table. I will. I'm, I'll grab. Yeah. Start eating and, like, listen to what he has to say. He doesn't um, say anything. Yeah, he's actually just kind of like... Uh, you, know. you said Gus tossed the letters aside? Yeah, he flipped through them, and he's like, he nodded and kind of... He didn't, like throw them or whatever he just kind of set them down on the, mm. on the couch made room for you at the table to sit down and eat Take, starts sure. taking off frank's manifesto he puts plops it down uh, along with the rest of the other boxes and he's like uh technically some of this belongs to you sean he points to the boxes it's what's left of his um safety deposit box i ended it out years ago um go ahead thank you appreciate that i'm gonna slip the letter Correct that box. i held out in the pile Sorry, uh, you're going to take what out of the pile? I'm going to sl slip the letter that I still have into the oh. pile. <laughs> are you are you doing so, uh, like, to try to, like, be sly about it, like, without, without Gus or anyone else noticing? Without, I don't care if Gus notices, but mm -hmm. without the rest noticing. Oh, okay. Wait, do we um, roll notice? Yeah, that would probably. Be a notice versus his... Yeah. Secrecy, yeah. I got an 18 on my 35 secrets. Yeah, that's a good roll. Nice. That is a really Jason's good eating. Roll. He's not going to be paying attention. Oh, I got a five. Well, the, the interesting thing is that you would have to roll under your skill, but above what they rolled. So the oh, higher above under, what they roll. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. okay. Unless you roll then, one. Then yeah. nope. <laughs> or a match. If you had gotten 11, that would probably be better. Uh, Sean doesn't care he's going yeah. through the contents of the safety deposit box and he's got some food in his mouth and he's just you actually find his manifesto kind of want awesome. gus to see it but so uh you you find a, a fairly lengthy piece of information that talks about that as you like are, are kind of like looking over you realize like this is his so-called manifesto, like his realization of what the world is, and it was like a de like a defining moment for him as you're like look, reading it through, Sean. As everybody's like chowing down, and the comp is just kind of sitting there staring at the empty walls. Um, 
You can read it if you like, or I'll read it for you if you prefer. It's sure, I'll read it. I, I like reading. Sure. Unless you want to. Nah, that's fine. I'm tired of hearing myself talk. <laughs> the lies are all around us. We are lied to daily by our peers, our family, business, even our leaders, especially our leaders. We even lie to ourselves. We keep obscuring reality, placing it under the facade of normal, normalcy. God, my <laughs> tongue yeah. right. can't, can't talk. Uh, for our safety, for supposed order, but you and I both know that everything falls apart eventually. And yet we try desperately to fix this, mend that. With reality, the deconstruction and disrepair of everything around us shows us that the truth is nothing, or is the truth that nothing is permanent. Time and fire eventually reveal things as they are truly for us. Fire especially. Fire is the great revealer. With it, we can burn away the lies placed in front of us. We can peel back the false layer and reveal the truth in all its ugly and incredible splendor. What a truth we have yet to see. We serve invisible masters. We dance and comply daily to their whims. And yet they're not gods. Not really. Once they were just like us, but through dedication or sometimes through blind luck, looking over, they, they embodied something special about the way our world is or was structured at that time. An archetype. They embodied this concept or ideal so much that they transcended reality and ascended. Ascended into this thing called the Godhead. Once that happened, they began to control every aspect of our lives. With all of them ascended, the world ends. You, me, and everyone else ceases to be. Then the world is recreated in their image. This terrible cycle has to stop, and I have a plan on how we can do it. This time around, we get to keep the world we have, and we get to change it on our terms, not theirs. But first, we have to burn away the things that help to perpetuate the lie, this myth that is our reality. First, we have to learn how to let go of our lives and let things fall apart. Only then will the truth be revealed. The Sternos and I found that the real power in, in our universe lies in the material and immaterial things that are important to us. When we allow those things to self-destruct or when we accelerate their destruction, that's when we can gain power to burn away the things that don't matter, the lies, all of it. The second and final step is the hardest because it involves completely destroying the myths and perceptions that create these invisible masters. Since they can only exist as long as society collectively creates these archetypes, we have to deconstruct and destroy these concepts in order to shatter their hold on our reality. Changing the world so this happens, no matter how much influence and power we have, can take hundreds of thousands of years. Entire generations will have come and gone in that time, and we would maybe phase out a dozen or so at best of these archetypes, when there are hundreds and new ones being born every year. No, the second and final step has to be sudden and drastic if we are to survive and keep the world from ending again. There's only one real way to do this, and it has to be done in a way that can't easily be prevented by conventional means. For this, the answer lies in the past and with those who are gone and who never were. Because all those times reality ended up and was reborn again resulted in uncounted amounts of death. They're still out there in the afterlife looking to get back in. So we let them and then watch from our protected haven as the rest of the world burns itself out. Hypocritically, you say? Yes. I understand the hypocrisy in saying we need to end the world in order to keep it from ending. But the point is just that. We need to end the world in order to keep them from ending the world. 
and from continuous this, this cycle of endless pain and destruction. Let it burn. Thank you, John. All right. So there's Frank Gordon's uh, mindset in a nutshell. That's a lot of steps to just break a system. <laughs> well, here, here's, yeah. here's a strange thing. I spoke to my mother this morning. I'm, she's been dead for almost 20 years. And she said specifically not to, not to summon them here. Because when they're summoned here, bad things happen. And then they're taken back and tortured. By who? Oh, she called them the... The cruel ones. The cruel ones is what she called them. That sounds like a, a name my mother would give something more than a real name. But summoning them here is going to would definitely cause a lot of problems. Not only for them, but for probably the world. They're supposed to be kept there, and it shows. Sean, did you read the, the manifesto out loud, or did you kind of internalize it? Uh, um, I, in, read I, it out loud? I internalize it, but I would like... I wouldn't actually read it out loud, because I assume Gus is doing He's his already read thing. It. Yeah, Lucius I would pass it. Your shoulder. <laughs> I wouldn't Lucius. pass it to Lucius because I'd be aware his head was right here. <laughs> but I would uh, pass it to Jesse. All right. And he passed it along. Anybody who wants to read it can. Gus is not, you know, running out to stop it. Anybody from looking at anything here, he purposely brought it over so you could do just that. If your plan was to become more like him or move away from, you know, the try to dismantle the proxy that he has over you or to do other things or to get an, an idea of what it is that he's doing or perhaps it was to perhaps shore up his credibility with you you're not sure so once everybody's done reading it damien's going to read it last and damien's going to look at gus and goes gus i got a question for you shoot if Frank succeeds at what he wants to do. That is going to screw up with the natural order of things, correct? Yes. Okay. So so we're on the same page that the clergy being full and the cycle starting anew is how it's meant to be. Unfortunately, it's unfortunate, but yes. Okay. My question is, if Frank succeeds, is there a failsafe somewhere in the cosmic whatever? Is there a failsafe that gets triggered if something like this happens? There has to be something. I don't know. That's the first time you've heard Gus say that, by the way. Yeah, like, you don't know? No. How can no you ever not done know? That? Because it's never happened before. We're on uncharted waters right now, Damien. What? I do know what will happen, though, if Frank succeeds. Billions will die. If Frank succeeds and billions die, so we... doesn't that... Oh, sorry. No, 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 perfect, good. So I cut, Sean. I'm like, sorry, but you're telling me that the powers that be do not have a failsafe if shit hits the fan. You mean a preventative measure? Yeah, not a preventative measure. If it happens, there's no failsafe. Well, there, there's nothing to be like, oh, wait a minute, this guy screwed the entire universe. We're just screwed. You're looking at the failsafe right now. <laughs> Us, we're the failsafe. Well, we're the we're what's <laughs> what, and he laughs. Putting, he's like, "Wow, <laughs> we're putting the finger in the dam right now, but the cracks are spreading." Let me let me ask a question real quick here. I mean, the Godhead sounds inevitable. 
You're right. It like is. that sounds that sounds like the end game. I mean, yes, it's not going, to, or yes, it's going to happen on an accelerated timeline right now. If Frank gets his way, that period of time lengthens out, and then what? He just keeps killing people so that the Godhead never happens. Like that doesn't sound like a feasible plan. Because people will slip through the cracks. Eventually, the Godhead will happen. And then there will be another calling, I imagine. That's what Frank is doing, isn't it? Is he emptying the Godhead somehow? Yes. Because remember, the old Godhead can only exist if there is a collective idea of an archetype that exists within society. Unless time moves it forward and those archetypes fall out of the consciousness, then the only other way to stop ascensions is to stop society. No easy way to do it. No easy way to go around it. <laughs> he floods the world full of uh, deceased souls from countless realities from beyond the veil. You're talking about hell on earth. People getting possessed. How can one back there. person do that? Well, he's not doing Alone? it himself. Can't. Doing that, so. What you saw in New Hampshire was a dry run for what he's going to be doing worldwide. And apparently he has a very, a very, very powerful Thanatomancer that can make it happen. I don't know who that is yet. <laughs> I fucking hate y'all. <laughs> Love you too, Sean. He says. <laughs> I hate all of this. How's your? Would it help like, if we made cafecito? another Frank? It's tasty. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's an idea. You can make. You want to make another one of him? <laughs> Remember, God. if you go that route, he is indistinguishable from the original. But would yeah. that, but but but. But we could imbue him with all the attributes of the proxy, like collectively that he had over us like that's you make my thought him whatever you can make him whatever you want but the the question is do you want do you make a frank gordon in accordance to the proxy or do you make one as far uh, like on the opposite side of the scale because if the purpose is to try to get a hands up on frank gordon that can go very badly if you make him just like the original, the original frank gordon article, yeah yeah right? no that Any obviously article? would need to be different somehow but I don't know. He's like, I, I mean, I just in the idea of making the, people. Ah, uh, yeah, you can make him that way. That seems to be a better option than than doing it to Jackson. And creating and creating a Jackson is to, is to create a exact opposite of Frank to that'll really slow him down. Alex doesn't like this line of, of questioning or this type of discussion. Um, but it seems like now that she's a little bit more relaxed now that it's kind of out in the open and Gus is talking about it. It's like, yeah, so. Oh, weird. You caught me. Frank was my protege. I was training him. I mean, well, we all make mistakes. And I'm trying it's to fix matter. mine matter of scale it's like yeah as did i i'm so, actually trying to fix that mistake right now well i mean it's can already I, can I, a known fact that we're only a few steps away from frank gordon can ourselves. i can i ask a question here real quick of course like i said I shoot away frank gordon let's run through a hypothetical for a second frank gordon wins he gets his apocalypse. The Godhead is completely emptied. But eventually the possessed people will die off, right? And you have society begun anew. There is a factor in there that does perhaps Frank didn't take into account because it's very obscure knowledge, but like it, like Gus said, he doesn't know what's going to happen because it's never happened before, especially not on that scale. 
He doesn't want it to happen because it means like billions of people are going to die and who knows what's right. going to happen after that. But there is something that you touched on earlier. The cruel ones. Very few people know a lot, uh, anything about the cruel ones. But they're basically wardens of the veil beyond where the souls of the deceased go after they die. No one knows what they're capable of because usually anybody who's seen a cruel one didn't make it out alive. They're extremely powerful from what anybody with uh, any ounce of a cult will know. And Gus can tell you if you ask him, he's like, I've never come across one myself. He's like, I've seen what they can do, though. Does, I guess my question is, will the Godhead be remade in a different perception? It's always different. It's always different because it depends on the, um, the makeup. Christ. Oh, this guy's doctor. fucking this guy's fucking insane. Regardless of what happened, it's just the same it's a different route to the same fucking outcome. Jesus Christ. Well, it's just <laughs> an outcome in which he's one of the 333. He just doesn't realize it. He's making his own godhead and Yeah, he's going to he's going to wipe wipe the entire thing and it's going to be rebuilt on its own. And it's going to continue again. He like will this... become the archetype. Yeah. He will set the archetypes and make certain who, who goes there and who doesn't. And it is remaking it in his own image, in his own way he wants it done. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. Frank Gordon will essentially effectively control the, the outcome of the Godhead and the rest of society on Earth if he gets his way. Happy thoughts. I don't want uh, control over him. He's like, well, we're on the subject of um, archetypes. There's this thing we need to check out. We need to do this for the clergy. Part of their, our new accord, or my new accord with them. He's like, something's emerging here in Miami, and it's threatening the order. We need to take it out, find what, what it is, and destroy it however we can. It's in its infancy right now, but it's getting traction fast. I don't know, have the details, but there is a place in Miami called, uh, notes here, one second, uh, the Miami Rescue uh, Mission, Miami Rescue Shelters. They're going to have information about these kids that disappeared. Apparently, it has something to do with that. Make contact with um, Jose Vega. He's the, um, it's a Catholic charity of sorts. He's the uh, director there. He's the person who oversees operations there on a daily basis. He's assisted by a plethora of assistants and sisters uh, belonging to the, the clergy, the Catholic church clergy. Uh, yeah, Miami Rescue Mission. Go check it out. It's off of Biscayne down, uh, or he tells you like it's down near, um, over town or whatever. Um, near Miracle Mile, he tells him. He's like, try it. He's like, um, head down there. Find out what they know about these kids that went missing. What supposedly has to do with this uh, entity. What it is and how we can potentially destroy it or dismantle it. Keep it from uh, becoming a, a larger problem overall. And he's like, uh, for right now, uh, Get some rest. You're going to need it. First thing tomorrow morning, though, we're, we're getting to work. Any questions? He leaves it at that. He kind of is like, enjoy the pastries. And he's like, uh, oh. And don't sleep in the uh, master bedroom. He kind of winks when he <laughs> walks to the back. He brings his things and he sets his stuff down. He shuts the door to the master bedroom. He leaves you to the rest of your devices. This is probably a good a, a place as any to take a short break, after which we'll return after about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, 5.43 Eastern Time, everybody. So we'll go with the guy.
back, everybody. Our team was just discussing what they were planning to do about Frank Gordon and possibly creating some mechanomancy uh, major effects in creating some automata in t turning the tables against their uh, enemy. And uh, that, around that time is when uh, the Comte de Saint Germain, or Gus as he likes to be called, gave you your next assignment. Uh, which is to make contact with somebody named Jose Vega, Father Jose Vega, at the uh, the mission rescue uh, Miami, mission, Miami rescue mission in Miami on Miracle Mile of all places. Yes, so I told you to get some rest for the rest of the evening. You know, uh, you're all, and I mean all of you, with the exception of Jace, are pretty battered up given the, everything that you've experienced within the last week. Um, so go ahead and uh, give yourselves back. If you take, if you don't do anything for the rest of the day and you just relax, you rest uh, the rest of the day and give yourselves back a... Uh, I, I'm taking... I'm tracking that, actually, so I don't know why I'm telling you. But, uh, uh, mm -hmm, a bit. Just a little bit. You do feel a little bit better the next day, but you still, a lot of you still feel sore. Lucius, you got shot at by a National Guardsman, and it mm -hmm. clipped you in the in the, the corner of your of your shoulder. Uh, it's healing up, but like if you roll like a match failure or something like that, the wound's gonna reopen. So you know, uh, having seen it, you see guys like you may wanna watch that. <laughs> I'm going to look at Lucius's shoulder. Sure, go for it. And I'm actually going to try something different than what I usually do, like for healing, which is like, oh, that's not that bad. I'm kind of pushing myself in regards to my abilities now. So I'm going to heal him, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at his wound and I'm going to do it my, as if I was reversing a clock with my fingers. I'm going to reverse entropy his wound. Excellent. Go ahead and spend the charge. Let me know what you got. I'm actually going to spend two charges for that, for healing him. Oh, okay. So, first charge, it's, awesome. not, it's not a d20, it's a 100. You get two cranks on the clock. <laughs> All right. So, here we go. Rotary telephone. All right, so I roll a 47, so I heal seven points for the first one. Oh, very good. And the second one, I heal eight. Oh, I got a forty-eight. You're completely healed, Lucius. So you see, like he uh, describe how this happens. Like, how does this look like when uh, Damien like uses his chaos magic on Lucius's wound? So he looks at the wound and he just like with his fingers does as if like he was reversing time, but he's not reversing time. He's reversing entropy. So uh -huh. the wound. It feels like if have you guys seen Tenant? Not yet. Oh, okay. So whenever something in reverse happens, that's what it looks like to the wound. It's like pieces of skin pops out of nowhere in the air and just puts itself back on his body, and it just stitches itself up. So interesting. So the way that you that basically works is that you basically altered what happened. So instead of Lucius actually having been shot, it was somebody else who got shot instead. <laughs> that, that works. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> someone else other than someone in the group. Yeah. Uh, poor whoever that was, but yeah, they took the shot instead. Somewhere the guy that we escaped with now has a bullet wound and is like crashing his car. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, what happened? <laughs> Grandma, why is your arm bleeding? That would actually be a major charge because the Anthropomancer's major effect is literally rewrite history. Ah, yeah. Oh, wow. So it's not quite to that extent. It was just yeah. like you changed it so that it with the trajectory of the bullet didn't quite go the way that it did originally. Like, oh, what are the okay. odds that instead of going this way, it went that way or whatever? And it's like, yeah, I just took a knife right. and that was basically it. <laughs> and I'm like, how does that feel? <laughs> yeah, brand better. new like it's just like <laughs> eh, it's better <laughs> okay yeah 
Yeah, like you feel no pain whatsoever. So nice. No, I'm like, huh? That worked. <laughs> it did. It. Um, okay. You see, Gus is like, I'm gonna, uh, he's like, he gets with you, Jesse, and he's like, um, long-term plans. This is just a private conversation he wants to have with you in the backyard. Uh, as soon as he walks out there, you hear like the dog, like. <laughs> And he's like, shh, shh. he kind of does like that, and the, the panting stops. Um, <clears throat> Dog's name. That's my first question before he says anything else. Lucifer. I Lucifer. Call him Good boy. <laughs> um, he's just like, so I wanted to ask you a specific, some very specific questions without anybody else being, you know. He's dropping on it, on us. Assuming well, as as... we succeed, he says, looking at you. What are your plans now that you know what you are? Well, the way I see it, we're just upholding the status quo of the current clergy. At least that's your plan. You had a different one? I wonder why we uphold anyone's status quo. Why are you not Frank Gordon? What makes you think I was never like Frank Gordon? What happened when you tried? He looks around. He looks at his house. The empty house. He's like, you already know. What do you think did this to my family? So, assuming this works and we stop him, what will you do? Exist until there isn't a reason to. You don't see a, um, a purpose for doing what I do? And like you say, as you said, upholding the status quo, he lights up a cigarette. He's in the gazebo outside, so he'll smoke. I mean, sure. It's one view of how the world should play out. But who am I to decide? Well, you are whoever you want to be. You're no longer the person you were. You have full freedom to be who the person who you want to be now. The decision is entirely yours. I think you imbue a poor machine with too much purpose. I think you're wrong, but if that's your choice, and so be it. Is that your final answer? Or do you need time to think about it? I don't think there ever is a final answer, right? It'll matter what matters when it happens. It's that is when answer. the choice must be made. It's a good answer, but you're dancing around the issue. You have to make a decision soon. Well, let's play it your way today, Gus. Play my way. All right. One moment. Or I'll use the other name for Gus, but. Oh, <laughs> you're letting him know that you know. And he's like, <laughs> okay, don't say that out loud too long, too much. Well, you were the one that made sure no one was listening to this conversation, so. <laughs> yeah. It's. I noticed that uh, 
the others didn't seem to bring that up. I don't know that... I don't know that any of them could have avoided this... avoided the sentimental decision for Jackson's purpose. Mm-hmm. In right. fact... I plan to forget about that soon enough anyway. Well, that's what's unique about you. You can you can choose to forget. I can't. Perhaps you should learn what I do. Not a good fit. <laughs> Are you to tell me you feel that your purpose in life is to be some sort of Akashic record? I think I was um, destined to be this. I've tried in the past to get away from that, and it didn't seem to work. And I've been punished for it repeatedly. So now there has to be another way. Well, it can't be me. <laughs> Noted. Be continued, then he says, and he takes a drag from a sticker, and he's like, "All right, I'll bring out, bring out a, bring out Damien. I want to have a talk with him out out here." Sure, I'll head back in, and uh, is is Damien in one of the rooms again, or are you still just hanging oh, out eating? Room? Yeah, I'm eating in the kitchen sure. or living room, wherever people. He wants you next. <laughs> he wants me next well apparently yeah. he's gonna ask us all what we're thinking careful not to all right. die <laughs> alright I go outside go to Gus you catch uh, Gus high fiving the tree ant he's like what's up asshole and you see the things like <laughs> one of the tree limbs or whatever is like <laughs> this is my high, like a weird high five or whatever he walks he watches them just kind of scuttle back in or whatever or plant not surprised the yard, your lawn <laughs> not surprised not questioning <laughs> he uh you know motions for you to join him by the gazebo he takes a drag from his cigarette and he's like i mean same question like he's just like assuming we succeed what are you going to do What can I do? Go with the flow. With the flow. There's nothing else I can do. I mean, if we succeed, when it gets full, everything gets reset. That's the way it is, right? Unless to, I uh, figure, unless I figure out a way to do what you do and like, just keep on going and when there's a reset, I'm still me. I would like to do that, even though it kind of looks like hell for you. But I'm not ready now to stop being who I am now. But if there's no way out of it for the rest of us, then, you know. Go with the flow. Go with the flow. Excellent answer. We'll put a pen in that for later. Thank you for that chit chat, Damien. Do you have any questions for me? No, not at the moment. All right, fair enough. Who do you want next? Lucius. Go back in, pick up food, tap him on the shoulder. Lucky you, you're next. <laughs> Lucius, assuming the manifesto was still out in the open, is looking at the manifesto. Oh yeah, it's just it's, so you know. It's really uh, yeah, <laughs> it calls to you. You're just like whoa. Inside, in the the past, the part that John read is like the real fundamentals of annihil uh, annihilism, annihilomancy, and like how to use it. And it talks about like destroying lies and things that are insignificant, accelerating their decay and their destruction, and revealing something else and stuff. Very interesting stuff. Um, very dangerous stuff in the wrong hands, of course. And then you get called to, to speak with uh, Gus in the backyard. 
he's just kind of leaning over the fence into the neighbor's yard. He waves at the dog that's sleeping back there, and he takes a drag from a cigarette. Lucius. Yeah. What's this You've about? You've changed, he says. He doesn't even look at you. Yeah. Something about the house, right? Changes house. people. Yeah. Yes. How did you change? Do you know? I learned to ask better questions. He smiles when he says that. He's like, do you know what you are? Do you know what you can do? You're called geeks in the underground. People who obsess over things night and day. Belief becomes reality. They create entire worlds inside of their heads. When they believe in it so much, it becomes almost infectious. It spreads, goes to other people, and inevitably, it starts affecting reality. You're a geekian. You're a geek, he says. Short for Magikian. Terrible name, but that's what people call you in the, in the underground. Some people, or most people like that, are, are unaware that they're changing the reality around them. But they do. You have a, the universe uh, chose you, I suppose. I don't know what the house did to you, though. How it may have changed what you did before. That's up to you to discover for yourself. The question, that's not really the question. That's not really why I brought you out here. I want to know what you think about all of this. When all is said and done, provided we don't all die trying, what do you do after this? Do you continue being who you were before? Are you someone else now? What do you think of this status quo, as it were? Uh, you see, I've been thinking. Mm. All of this just caused by a system. I knew that. Before I knew some system keeping us all all down. So I'm thinking maybe there's a way to break it. Without, you, you know, know, murdering thousands upon thousands of people. Well, that's a good thing to say, because for a moment there, you reminded me of a, a protege of mine. I'm sure you can imagine who. Mm. And again, you also remind me of myself in a way. I had the same thoughts once upon a time. Yeah, that protege of yours was really something. There's something you should probably know about me. I don't know everything, despite what some people may think. I'm not all powerful. I don't know all the answers. In fact, even in the time that I've served the clergy, I've only scratched the surface of what actually exists out there. Cosmic rules and the mechanics behind what happens behind the scenes, behind this, uh, underneath the surface of reality, I don't know. If that's something that interests you, then perhaps I have something for you to do after all is said and done. I may have a task for you to perform if you're interested, of course. Hmm. Oh, what is it? This. He kind of motions to himself. And he's like, exploring the mysteries of the universe, the systems that are in place, that create the, the strata, the architecture that we all embody. Is that what you're currently, is that what you're 
Is that what you're constantly thinking about? Like how you used to think about conspiracy theories or shadow people? Is that what occupies your mind now? Need time to think it over. I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> it's alright, you're not the only one. We'll pick it up later. To be continued, he says. Send Alex in if you get a chance, please. Alright. Go to tell Alex, uh, and she just like, she hears like, she sees that uh, everybody's taking, uh, getting on the merry-go-round to go speak with Gus. You tell her, hey, he wants to go see you, and she's like, no. He doesn't make eye contact with you. She just looks down, like shakes her head. No. Just kind of lean in a bit. Why not? She kind of looks, glances at you for a second, and she's just like, "I have nothing to say to him. Choose someone else. Your choice now. You want to send Jace <laughs> or uh, Sean back there? Uh, I'm gonna go to Sean. All right. And they just pat on the shoulder like, all right, he wants to speak <laughs> with Alex, but she's not going. Oh. What were we doing again? I wasn't paying attention. No, this is in character. Is it not John? <laughs> <laughs> it's bad I have to specify that. <laughs> it's all right. He's having a heart to heart with everyone. You know? First time that's happened. First opportunity that he's had a chance to do that. Well, color me impressed. Uh, he gives me the time of day. All right. I'm going to pretend you like you said it was me. All right. All right. Let's go. <laughs> you go outside and he kind of like smiles when he sees you walk through the doorway. He kind of nods and continues uh, working on his cigarette. He comes he, and waves you over. Does he have a beer in his fridge? Um, No, but he does have alcohol. <laughs> like well-aged spirits. That's the one thing he does have in his fridge that isn't spoiled that you can uh, partake in. I'll grab two cups and head on out. Yeah, it's some really nice wine and champagne. Just assorted alcohols in there. You pour yourself a drink. You give him, You bring him one also? Yeah, I'll put well, you just set the glass down on the table. You, you feel like it? Sure. It takes a, it takes a swig. He's like, uh, I'll be blunt with you, Sean. I don't think you're going to have the answer I'm looking for. I understand that you have a son and a life you want to live with your son. I completely respect that. But I feel like I should ask anyway. When all this is said and done, assuming we don't die trying, averting disaster. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big if. Big if. I need someone to do what I do. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but time is running out. I have noticed. Actually. I mean... I'm not going to tell you no, honestly. If I didn't have my son, I might just jump on the bandwagon. He... He, uh... This... this... Oh, sorry. That's alright, go ahead. Frank... The way he's going about this, mm -hmm. the bullshit he's putting everyone through just to feed his own god complex. Like, it doesn't end any differently for Jackson or myself. We die in this scenario, regardless. I spend what little time I have with him, and then he dies. I succeed, and we, judging by your appearance, no offense. Uh, I spend what little time I have with him, and he, we die. Uh, if I didn't have, like, I'm not going to tell you no, because honestly, if something happens to Jackson, I want a way out. Exactly. That's what I thought. 
Yeah. He uncharacteristically tells you, and he's like, don't tell the others, but I made a deal with the clergy. You do this job, I get a replacement. I appreciate the candor, and I pour him another drink. It's appreciated. To hopefully a happy ending. You want me to send well, somebody so else? He, said, he holds them up. He's like, to all endings. He clinks your glass. Takes a swig. Bring in Jace when you get a chance. Nod, so I go back. Uh, we're all having a uh, powwow outside, a uh, heart to heart, a uh, melding of mutual uh, 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 conversations and, and ideals. You're you're wanted out there, Jace. Go on now. Joy. He slaps the deck of cards down and walks outside, looking irritated, but in his slouchy way. Mm-hmm. Hey there, Jace. Hey, hey boss. Jay. He's like, hey, Jay. Hey, boss. I'm going to have to ask you some questions here. Now that you know what we're up against, what's happening, what's ahead of us. I need to know, given what you know now about the universe and where it's heading, what are your thoughts if we survive what Frank Gordon is bringing? What will you do? What will I do if I survive? Be honest, boss. Hell if I know. I mean, shit. I never belonged to anything. Never really mattered. Never had a direction in life. To that, yeah, I think spending time with you has been the most direction I've ever had. And he's like, um, to them, you may not mean much, but what you've done, the work that we've done together, matters. Is that something that you would want to continue? Yeah, boss, you think about it, I mean... Choose carefully. There's no getting off this train. Not easily. Oh, hell, I knew that when I got on board. Look, I I spend the rest of my my pitiful existence getting drunk and getting booed out of clubs. Or I can, I don't know, maybe make a difference somehow? You can always try, right? What you said, you said before, I'm a living embodiment of chaos. I just, wherever I go, it's going to happen. The world's got to have chaos in it. And it always will. So, you know, yeah, I, I, I could stick it out. I think uh, it's the first time, like I said, I felt like I had a, a real purpose. Yeah, that's purpose. An interesting, that's, that's, an interesting that's the word. word. Hmm. Good. Thank you, Jay. I'm glad I brought you along for this. I yeah, had a, feeling, I had a good so feeling about you. I'm, I'm, if I could say, I'm, I'm, I'm really worried about Sean. It's going to get worse before it gets better. I thought so. I mean, you need to watch out for him. Oh, it's hard to, hard to do that, but, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah. And, and watch he just, Lucius. He's, he's like, um, like if you see anything about him that, Seems odd, or you get a weird feeling about him. You tell me immediately. It's not a watch, Lucius, and it's a it's a watch, Lucius, and just be cautious. Yes, good because I can't do that first part. That's fine. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, and yeah, boss. Like, uh, hey, one more I thing. Get some sleep. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, we can't answer this, and it, it, it's maybe silly to ask, but uh, hell, I gotta ask. If anyone asks, I ask you. Sure. Why sure. me? Why? Why am I here? Well, of all of all people in this stupid fucking universe, am I here? Why did I choose you, or why are you here? Why? Why? Why was I chosen? I mean, I, obviously, I was chosen beyond your pay grade in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't make any sense to me. 
want to let you in on a little secret. None of us really choose. Not really. The universe does. The universe casts a die. And based on what happened on that result, things occur. Sure, we have free will, but ultimately, if it's not in the cards, it's not in the cards. That's real chaos. The universe plays with our lives. And then we basically are you have to play those cards. And he looks at your <laughs> the, the ones in your pocket. Yeah. I think it's I think you get the metaphor, don't you? No, I get it. I still say the universe uh, I still say universe roll craps on the come out roll with me, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. It's always a crap hand. You just have to deal it in the right way. I used to be playing solid earlier. I had around. a crap hand. <laughs> it's like maybe the next time around it'll be better. Maybe. I guess it's worth sticking out to find out. Exactly right. With that, he puts out a cigarette and he goes back inside. All right, kids, he says. This is going to be the last go around. I need you to do this thing for me, for the clergy. And then we're going to go full into chasing after Frank Gordon. We're going to be heading northwest, he says, given the information that you provided, Damien. He's like, I'm going to start digging up some information, getting some plans together, weapons, transportation, etc. When we're done here in Miami, we're heading northwest, and we're going to, we're going to go hunting. So, I have some logistics to work out. I need you to look into the other thing. Get some rest first thing in the morning, he says, and he holds up the keys to the uh, station wagon outside. He hangs them on this little hook by the door. Or is yours. You take it wherever you like. I'll be gone by then. Good night. Unless any of you want to do anything for throughout the uh, the rest of the evening, the rest of the evening passes by relatively quietly and calmly. Nothing really outrageous happens. Next morning, he's gone, and you're left to your own devices. You're left with the keys to the car, and uh, your things and also all the things that uh the gus brought in from the car uh which include of course everything that he has of frank gordon's his own personal effects and stuff like that that he left in the uh, uh safety old safety deposit box in a bank um, there's all manner of different things in there about proxy rituals and stuff like that knowledgeable stuff that you can accumulate if you want to um how I loot. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I just, uh, I, I, like, I assume it's in the folder I was looking at earlier. Mm -hmm. And I'll just pick it up and be like, uh, this has a bunch of bullshit that I don't even want to look at. Lucius? Yeah. You, and it's you, just like it's up off the couch. You, uh, uh, you want to learn some creepy magic bullshit? <laughs> yeah, pass it here. Okay, all right, here you go. Excellent. Just starts flipping through it. Because when we think, we think creepy magic bullshit, we think Lucius. Uh, it works out well, I guess. All right. Surprised we don't I, think I about mean, Damien. I mean, Damien can if he wants to. Like Lucius just seemed like the obvious choice because he's more into cult. Mm -hmm. type stuff where Damien's pure chaos and Mike uh, I don't know what Mike does so uh, you know uh, <laughs> I, I was going to say the same thing Damien's pure chaos he doesn't need uh, any more creepy magic bullshit he's got it uh, wired into his system and I ain't <laughs> touching that stuff nope and I don't want to touch his stuff <laughs> Jesse do you want to touch his stuff Annihilomancy I mean I could make a robot that would do it Moving that away from Jesse. <laughs> Lucius. <laughs> Best thing we need well, is an annihilation robot. <laughs> Skynet. Yeah. yeah, I'll call it Skynet. Yeah. It'll be fine. Call it Skynet. It'll be great. <laughs> Wasn't there a robot in the comic books that, uh, yeah, I can't remember his name, but yeah, something like that. You never can't be stopped. It doesn't have a server. <laughs> Oh, I thought that was the proxy stuff. 
was a annihilant. Like his no. Oh, is it all the same? Fancy, wasn't it? Yeah, that, I'm pretty sure he does. Like that's the name of his magic, right? Yeah, the school of magic is yeah. He basically lets things destroy or actively goes out and destroys things. Not just but, physical things, but like, you know, he can sabotage a relationship or you know what I mean. Like he, they destroy things or let things be destroyed and waste away. And that's how they kind of get their power. They, they the taboo would be to fix something to repair and so on. You see the the dichotomy here between Gus, the repairman, and Frank the destroyer. Well, one thing I have, one thing I do know is that once an adept belongs to a school, like myself, mm -hmm. it's impossible to adopt another school. But I don't know about archetypes. Yeah, you've never heard of a, someone who's an, uh, an avatar and an adept. That's Probably a good, uh, you know, concoction, a good uh, cocktail for insanity, <laughs> essentially. I mean, you know, you're having to follow two very strict uh, rule sets. Uh, you don't, you can't imagine how that would work or how anybody can function normally by adhering to two very strict sort of like ways of, uh, of being to essentially follow philosophies like, you know. Of course, living, there are also there are living people two who different paradigms at the same time. Yeah. Then again, there are people that are avatars and they don't even know it. So they almost have to be complimentary. I mean, that's a lot of reading. If it were up to me, I just I rather watch. If I could watch it on YouTube, totally. But uh, <laughs> reading, man, I don't have the, I don't have the, I don't have the patience to read that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's great. And, and I'll look over Jesse and be like. I'm, I'm just kidding and all serious. If you want to look at it, look at it. It's some freaky fucked up bullshit. I don't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> For keys uh, specifically, like if you were interested in getting into a, a type of magic, your obsession would have to change. Oh, which yeah. Which means other things about you would change. Yeah, Lucius would have. be flipping through all the annihilomancy stuff and occasionally be nodding like yeah this makes sense and then oh no, <laughs> no <this is laughs> he's like oh yeah destruction <laughs> get rid of that ties with everyone you know yeah no. <laughs> <laughs> destruction kill, so the, kill, unnecessary. The, kill the first death the first board <laughs> Shit. Yeah. if the point is to get rid of the system and lucius slams it close throws it down why not just start breaking systems what <laughs> Because you have Infinitely to break your people. To do, you would imagine. Like, God damn, that sounds like a lot of work too. God damn. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, in the morning you wake up, you have time to put your things together. When uh, and or did you want to do something prior to going to the the Miami rescue mission? No, uh, I was gonna I'm say gonna... I probably have the directions to the rescue mission like printed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He gives you all the information necessary to make contact with them or how to find them in, on Miracle Mile. I'm going to clean and Miami. just make sure our Pepsi truck guns are good to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're good to go. You're locked and loaded. Unless anybody else wants to do anything else prior to that, then assumingly you all pack up into the... Into the um, hey, Damien. The car. Yes. Minus Alex. Alex is just like I'm. No, it's not, not what cool. is it? I don't. I don't want to go. Yeah. All right, Alex, you got you got to ride home. It's like I'm, I'm, stay, I'm staying here at the house. Okay. It's really, Alex, that's kind of not safe. Better to be safe than numbers. You don't want to be staying in the house by yourself. If there are I have a entities gun. here, she that's says not going to work against entities. You think you can shoot a ghost? I'm not. I, I, are, are we afraid of the ghosts in this house? Are they no? But can you shoot are they them? Dangerous to us? I'm not. I'm not planning on shooting you, a ghost. You seem rather afraid of them. So I just what? got spooked out. I mean, you know, you know, I could just not go to this place. Why don't you just children come are with disappearing. us? Why don't you just come with us? You don't have to go inside. Just you know, better be safe in oh, numbers. Roll I'm connect. Just... Because <laughs> she's really hesitant about going anywhere right now. All she's right. Like, oh no, I don't. I don't want to do anything Gus wants to do. Like, fuck this guy. This, this shit's dangerous. 
Nope. Well, you know, sitting on your ass and doing nothing is just is typical for your generation. But I mean, come on, <laughs> you could do far better than that. Oh, he's just, just kind of like you know. <laughs> Anybody successfully roll uh, connect? I'm working on that. Oh, okay. No. Uh... Ah, fifty-five out of sixty. That's, rolls that's connect. good. That's a max success. You, the thing about that you threw at her about, oh, it's it's all right. Sitting on your ass is typical for your generation. She's just like, and then she gets up and like, <laughs> fine, fuck, and like she can walk, like stops out and goes to the car and shuts the door and just kind of sits there like this with her arms crossed, like motherfucker, fucking boomer. <laughs> <laughs> Got the okay uh, boomer out of, <laughs> out of Alex. <laughs> you and all, I know how I could clear clubs. <laughs> you all pile into the car it's an old station wagon but it rides pretty smooth uh you think it's downtown miami you go, go under the uh the overpass and it's it's a it, this place is um noticeably uh downtrodden this entire area there's a lot of like medical facilities and stuff like that there's a lot of pain here uh which is evident the moment you roll through the the uh, the neighborhood and you look outside your window and you see like there's people just like sleeping on the sidewalk uh, arguing, fighting on the side of the road, you know, running away from the from the cops and stuff like that. Cops barely even come into the in places like this. Um, you pull up to the the mission, which is like a one story facility. It has iron, like a metal, like black metal uh, bars uh, that kind of create like a, a perimeter around it. But there's no actual like security per se or anything like that. There's like a rent a cop or something like that who's armed. Uh, but they kind of sit on the inside of the fence. So they basically do like a perimeter check and whatever. And most of the time, the, the staff there, which is largely composed of nuns, you notice, uh, and proctors, uh, they just sort of like walk like a Greek chorus, uh, you know, around uh, the children and then just kind of like, you know, in groups of three or more. And just kind of watch them and direct them. Uh, there is a single basketball pole outside on the, on the, tarm on the, um, on the asphalt. There's a couple kids like playing basketball there. the The typical range of the children here are anywhere from like uh, ten up. And uh, the oldest kid you see here, and it's not many of them, but uh, the oldest kid you see here is like in the preteens, like fourteen, fifteen years old, or something like that. Now there's a pair, a uh, pair of girls like hanging out outside the uh, the main proctor's uh, office. It's kind of like an L-shaped or U-shaped rather building. And uh, there's a large portion of the building on this side, on, on the far side of the building, where all the kids stay at. Uh, it's, kind, it's actually kind of eerily reminiscent to most of you, except for Jace, as the old orphanage, where it's like one big room and there's like cots and stuff like that. It's almost like a barracks. It's very, it's not very well funded, but it is clean from what you can tell. As clean as any, anything out here is, uh, with, you know, the infrastructure being what it is. The old infrastructure on the other side of the building though in between or actually in between the barracks we'll call them are the individual classrooms where like the proctors hold class and uh or they go over like counseling with the individual uh people kids who stay here this is essentially a homeless shelter for kids and uh from come from uh, broken families and what have you on the far end of the building though is the main office and you see like there's like a um older hispanic man uh maybe in his like his 40s uh dark skin a uh, bit of the stubble beard hair up to here uncharacteristically long hair for a catholic priest in the full get up and he's walking with a, a nun also somewhat fairly young uh with the habit and everything all black and you see he's holding like papers for him and she they're, they're just kind of like talking and walking uh, away from his office, uh, le leading out of the facility as you're pulling up. The security guard meets you at the gate, and he's just like, um, he's like, yeah, he's like, uh, sign the list, and he kind of like hands one of you, whoever wants to volunteer, to like sign in, like, uh, state your business. I'll sign it. Okay. I'll take it. <laughs> Don Rickles. <laughs> Wiley Coyote. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, that's tempting, uh, but no. <laughs> He's just like, um, all right, um, how can I help you all? Yeah, we're, we're here to speak to um, Jose Vega. 
Vega, one moment. He's like, he, the, he, you know, the gate's shut. Um, so like he walks away for a minute and he sees Vega walking with the, the nun. And he's like, uh, father, father. And he walks over to the guy and he's like, there's some people here to see you. They say they, they expecting you. And he kind of stops. He looks at him, looks back at you all. And he says something to him. And the guy just kind of shrugs a little bit and he like makes this gesture like, and then Vega's like, no, 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 no. And he says something to the sister and he starts walking with the security guard to the gate. How can I help you gentlemen? Am I, was I, am I supposed to be expecting you? Well, kinda. I think we, we were here to speak to you about uh, some uh, missing kids. Oh, are you with the press? No, not the press. We don't. Uh, we don't do that. We we solve problems. You're not with the police. Have the police really helped you? No, but they professed it to to help. And they profess a lot of things. We're professional problem solvers, sir. You see the guard looks at him like, let him, let me let him in. And he's like, I was on my way out, but yes, it's fine. Go right ahead. All of you roll notice, please. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> 100. Uh, oh. I made mine with a 43. Oh, 98. Nope. Oh. Mm. Uh, mm. Who made it? I'm going to re. Can I re roll that 100? You can. Or you, you can use one of your re rolls. Yeah. 100. Not good. All right. So using one of my re rolls and notice. Here we go. 10. Not much better. Much better. Yes. So those of you who made it, he starts walking away from the gate. Guard opens it up, unlocks it. You see a couple kids curiously look on. Two young girls are like kind of sitting next to each other aside from watching the kids play basketball. And they sort of like watch you go by. They kind of giggle to themselves a little bit as you as you walk past them. You go find a place to park, come out. Uh, those of you who made it, you see that there's a car down the street across the alleyway. And uh, there's somebody there waiting in the car. And you see when Vega walked away from the gate, they start pulling up. And they're just like slowly driving through. There you spot uh, two men in the front seat. It's a nice car. It's like a Buick LeSabre or some bullshit and uh, tinted windows. But you can tell even but, but some of the windows are like, uh, even though they're tinted dark, some of them are halfway down. Someone's inside smoking. And as the car rolls by, there's two large men in the front. And they just seem to be watching you and Vega as you go in. And the security guard sees them and just kind of like stares at them as they roll by. And they just keep going. I take a uh, look Vega, at the uh, at the plates. Try to take, take a gander at the plates. Yep. I'll say with the 10 that you, you managed to like glance at it and you caught it. And like you know what the license plate is. You can write it down from memory. Yep. Uh, Vega brings you into his office. It's cl it's a clutter of papers. His desk is like stacked high uh, with stuff. He's got a small little personal computer. Nothing nothing fancy. Um, he has a few chairs. Not a whole lot of room to go around. He's like, I'm sorry, I don't have enough accommodations to, to meet with you. Uh, but please have a seat if you can. Uh, he offers his own chair. And he prefers, he, he'll offer to, he'll doff to stand up and just sort of kind of cross his arms, leans against the one corner of the room. One thing you all notice though, are masks. They're lining the walls. Different masks from different cultures. How can I help you, gentlemen? I just take a look around in the office and I'll let someone else talk. I think Do you? Are you a collector? I am, yes. Why the, why I, uh, the masks? My travels have taken me to different places in, in the world. Uh, 
masks are interesting, uh, culturally speaking. Uh, they pop up in almost every culture that I've come across. Uh, even they, some of them even have religious connotations. And he points to like a, uh, and some of them are just uh, cultural. And he points to like one, it's like a Japanese no mask, like on the far side of the wall. Uh, he points to other ones and he's like, this one, he, he's like, a, this one's more religious. And he points to one that looks like a demon, like a face of a, like a very colorful looking demon, yellow, blue face with dots. And like horns coming from the top and from the bottom and like a wide mouth and teeth and stuff like that. Tribal. He's like, that one's from Puerto Rico. And he's like, uh, like the natives there believed in, in demons, uh, but they also believed as part of their religion that wearing such masks can scare things like demons away, keep them uh, from harming the, their community. So yes, in a way I am, I am a collector of these sort of esoteric items is that what you came here to do is, is, like, is that why you came here are you collectors as well or are you looking to purchase i'm not offering to sell if that's uh, your intent it is quite the interesting collection but uh no we are here about missing children i see yes we've been uh in communication with the local sheriff's department uh, and trying to find these children have disappeared. It's like many of them, many of them uh, are presumed to have run away or have fallen into the wrong crowds. Uh, some have taken drugs. It's a very, it's a very sad story. Uh, either way, it's been in the newspapers. I know. Uh, we're doing what we can with what we have to try to find these kids and try to keep the ones that we do have from getting lost, uh, figuratively and literally, of course. How many kids have gone missing so far? In the last five years, we've lost close to a dozen. A, a dozen kids have gone missing from here, and you're still allowed to just let them wander through a courtyard? They were not under our custody at the time that they disappeared. It's like many of them were taken back from their with, from their parents. They were in the custody of their of their guardians at the time. Or they had left the mission altogether, run away. A dozen. We, we don't have the sort of resources that we require to retain a lot of these children or to protect them. You've seen this facility, but the city doesn't deem uh, organizations like ours essential. So there's you're no, saying there's no funding for this. You're saying you're saying that. It, based. You're saying that. Your organization is not, your organization is kind of hands off on these 12 missing kids. Like you think that they went to their parents or some other place and like they just never came back. Has anybody filed a missing persons report? Several, several. Uh, it's like, um, and they just, just let, you're assuming that 12 kids either fell on hard times or got mixed up in the wrong crowd or like 12 seems like a lot we're not assuming anything and he's like that is what we were told by the authorities or by people who associated or knew them they assumed the worst but there is no uh, there's obviously no no leads in that regard the police have unfortunately been in a big city exist. like this, in a neighborhood like this, I doubt the police are even looking for them. Unfortunately, that's true. That's why we came. We figured that if we talked to you, we could understand a little bit more about the kids that are missing and, and see if we could turn up leads in our own way. That's very generous of you. But normally when we have people around here asking to help, there's usually a, um, a catch. We don't have a lot of money, he says. We're privately funded, uh, so that's the money is not something we're worried about. What organization are you with? Exactly? Is there a, is there like a donations box sitting on the table? Uh, yeah, or like we'll a say donation that there's like a tray. little. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we're gonna. I'll say take that out a like crisp hundred dollar like bill and set it in it. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. I just I, um, 
for records, I need to know if what organization you all represent exactly. Uh, Gus's private investigators for all time. <laughs> for all time? <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> limited. He's just Pink. like <laughs> limited. <laughs> LLP. All time limited. He's like, do you have a business card or? Oh wait, over... do I have a business card? I think I might check and see if I have a business card. I look over hey. at Jesse. Do we have a business card? Hold on. Let me let me just check my architecture pool. See if I actually he have kinda, one. He kind of you know narrows his eyes a little bit. Like, mm, well, no. if nope. if you're interested in uh, assisting us, I'm sure I can schedule something between you and Sister Frida. Uh, Miss Santiago will be more than happy to assist in filing up any paperwork and going through any any sort of giving you any sort of information. We just need to make sure that we have this officially on the record and ever. This is Damon. This is where you sort of excel at. It's kind of like fast talking past all the. Uh, red tape bureaucratic bullshit and uh also you know making it so that you seem legitimate when you're actually not, not really <laughs> this is an opportunity for you to be like uh oh, well actually uh you know I'll, I'll talk them up if you want to if you want to we're here to help yes. okay i have no doubt of this uh but i've never heard of you and i understand the, I understand what you're saying, but this is something very dear to us, like missing children. Considering the fact that I myself grew up in the orphanage. I grew up in an orphanage. Our friend here, Sean, grew, also grew up in an orphanage. I nodded Jesse. He also grew up in an orphanage. So this is something very dear to us, Padre. Please let us help. I'll, I'll gladly take any help uh, if you're willing to offer. Of course, uh, that wasn't a question. It's just uh, we obviously I understand. Be careful about who we allow in here. We're talking about children here. I 100% understand. But we are in a position where we understand. We went through what these kids are going through. Ah, so you have an outreach program. Okay, very good. Um, let me get in contact with uh, Sister Frida. She can probably show you around the place. I was actually just leaving uh, for the day, but uh, you're welcome to uh, view the facilities. Uh, Ronald at the front gate and Sister Frida will be more than happy to answer any of all and all of your questions. I'll lead you where I'll give you the penny tour, as it were. Uh, thank you for stopping by, gentlemen. It was a pleasure. No, Hoping thank you, Padre, can... for all the job you're doing and thank watching you. over these kids. He excuses himself. He leads you out of his office and he calls over Ronald, as it were, and uh, Sister Frida. And, and he's like, show them around, please. Uh, he's like, I have to take my leave for right now, but I'll be back tomorrow. And you see, she, she nods. I understand, by the way. Of course. Of course, Father. Um, they, she starts leading. Right this way, gentlemen. Let me show you, uh, let me show you around the, the premises. As she starts leading you away, uh, you see... Uh, Vega look over at the security guard and whispers something into his ear, taps him on his arm, on his shoulder, and starts walking off with his briefcase. Uh, with his things, he locks his uh, office and goes out to the uh, the parking lot. He doesn't have a car. He's just walking wherever it is that he's going. What do you do? Pull Damien aside for a second. Uh, just kind of very hushed. Uh, be like, hey, you got. Can you, can you get any intel on what's going on with these kids? Maybe the person behind it? You need to take a look around, I think. Uh, all right. As, as Unless a, they want to do something differently. You see Sister Frida like, keeps an eye on you and walks you around the, the premises of the, uh, the facility. You see a He's couple not... of kids, like, you know... Oh, sorry, oh. go ahead. I was going to say, when kind of leaning, chatting to Damien in between the transfer of us getting passed to somebody else, I'll ask, uh... He's not giving off any weird vibes, is he? Trying to, like... Well, did head... anything pop up in Aura Sight? Oh, good question. Roll your Aura Sight. Um, I don't 
don't think it's on the actual list here. So I was at 55. So I'm going to roll 1d100. 1d100. Fail. <laughs> oh, come on. 86. <laughs> Remember, remind me at the end of the session to roll for that because it's you're yeah. especially going to increase it. Um, you're looking at Vega and you have your aura sight on, just like a cipher, man. You're just like, like you're not able to read him. Weird. I can see everybody else except him. Yeah. Jesse's question. Um, that's I weird. didn't pick anything. I didn't pick anything from him. Like I can see everybody's aura here except his. So something's well, definitely fishy. Keep an eye out. See if anyone else sticks out. I look at the nun. Normal. Um. Do objects give off auras? Sometimes, if they're if they're significant, you do see. One of the two little girls Those sitting masks. together off, off away from the uh, the basketball court. You see one of the little girls give off like a rather unique aura. I've seen one like that before. I I head Please. towards the kids. Sure, you can go over to them. Which ones? You see there's several kids on the... Uh, the one with the weird ass aura. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> The well, WSA. There's there are two there are two young girls. You veer away from the group and uh sister uh Santiago is just like uh gentlemen? Um uh, she like looks over to Damien who's like splitting off like blue angels and going towards the, the kids by the basketball court. Um is he joining us or is he leaving? Following his own lead. Ah. Okay. I'll, well, I'll right go, over here, I'll go with him. Counsel. You go with him. Yeah. All right. Uh, she's like, this is these are their classrooms. So, you know, we tutor and uh, we mm -hmm. counsel as well. And this is, I mean, she kind of gives you the penny tour. You've already figured out what this place is more or less by looking at it. But she gives you the. the tour. I'm gonna ask like uncomfortably every time she gives us some silly piece of information. I'm gonna ask her something about the kids, uh, like along <laughs> the lines of like. You know, she tells us this is the classroom where we teach, you know, how many of the missing children went to school here. Uh, and, you know, like trying to get relevant information out of her. She's like, well, all of the children here at the mission inevitably come into this room at some point or another. Uh, it's like further down actually is the chapel. And she points to like, as the doors are, she opens the door past the little classroom there's like a uh, set of doors and they're open as well and you can see that it's almost like a small area where you can like the priests or can conduct like a, like a like a miniature mass or something like that with a group of people it's like a chapel it's a larger something some, a little bit larger than a, than a regular chapel so there's like seating and stuff like that um and it's like and this, this is where father vega gives a, a weekly mass and so on He's like, uh, but yes, all of them, including the ones that unfortunately went missing, also were here at some point or another. Did you know them well? I mean, some of them, yes. Not, it's impossible to know all of them. We try. I understand. But he kind of, and over here is where we're, uh, he's like, where are um, a lot of them are you know, make their make their home. This is a new home. Really. She takes you over there. Uh, Damien, you and uh, Sean approach these two young girls that are sitting watching the other older kids play basketball. And you see, uh, as you approach, they kind of look at each other and they giggle to one another. The one who uh, shines uh, to you, uh, we're going to say is Crystal. And the other one is Lila. She shines. Mm -hmm. She's got the shining. No. <laughs> you see, they're like... Red drum red. <laughs> <laughs> And you see one of the girls like stranger danger and you see the other girls just like <laughs> uh so the girl that had that that yeah, has that ain't weird stranger but the me <laughs> <laughs> that has that weird shine about what is she doing specifically now she's just sort of giggling she just, she's not saying anything you know so i look at how oh, mike's with the other group right mm -hmm. oh no all right <laughs> So I like I gesture like the ball. 
Ball, please, ball. Come on, ball. Ball. <laughs> you, the, the, the kids that are playing are older than them. They're like in their preteens and they're just, they see these old guys coming over. They're like, hey, let me see the ball. And they're like, yeah, okay. Like they just keep on playing and ignore you. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Teenagers right, so, are assholes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. I remember being one of those. Uh, so, all right. I'm like, whatever. All right. Sit down next to the little girl. I'm like, hi. Hi. What's your name? <laughs> she goes like, my name's Crystal. Hi, Crystal. I'm Damien. I'm Lila. You see the other one say, she's the the more forward of the two. Hi, Lila. How are you? I'm fine. All right. How cool. are you? Great. I'm good. Thank you very much for asking. So, um, how long have you two girls been here at the orphanage? At the mission, you see Crystal mm, say, at the mission. Um, like, like counting on her hands, like I don't know, like a year. A year, okay. And how how's it going so far? He shrugs. Is everything good? Being treated well? Yeah, I guess. Is that Crystal answering, or is it Lila? Uh, that would be Crystal. Sorry. All right, all right, good, good. Me too. I grew up also in a mission. Did. She's like, oh, yeah. yeah? You see, Lila notices your scars, Sean. It's like, are those real? Kind of like, he, he, he kind of like flexes his, his muscle a little bit. Yeah, they're so real. <laughs> oh, my God, she says. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, and he, he quickly, like, fuck, wait, I'm not a dork, don't, whatever. <laughs> you see, uh. Just... He says all that entire line of sentence out loud too. <laughs> He's like, "Wow, I'm like... an idiot." Cool. <laughs> you see, uh, Crystal is just kind of like, you see, uh, to your question, uh, it's like how life is there. She's like, kind of shrugs. So I just, you know, have a casual chat. You know, my body language is very non-threatening. Yeah. And, it, and I'm like, so you. You guys heard about the missing kids? No, we know we knew them. You knew them. them. Wow. And uh, you guys know you know anything strange about about what happened in regards to them missing? Anything strange happened here at the mission? Anybody that you know you've seen that didn't fit here or you didn't know? No, well, some kids ran away, she's like, but some kids like Rico. Rico. Yeah. Okay. Rico got what happened taken to by Rico? The, like, we, I mean, she's like, she looks around when she's supposed to answer you and she leans in. It's like, Rico got taken by the crying lady. By the crying lady? Mom, Who's the you, crying lady? You don't know who the crying lady is? No. Can you tell me? I can tell you some things. All right. Who's story time? My favorite. Shit. <laughs> but, oh, well, like, uh, Sean's, Sean's kind of joking a little bit, but he does want to keep an eye out for like people who are watching us. You know, like uh, there's going to be some side eyes because we're two grown adults talking to teenagers in a mission that have had, how, how, had kids what, gone missing. But yeah. How, how old again do they look like? Like specifically uh, Layla and uh, Six Crystal. and seven. They're very seven. young. Okay. All right. She's like, yeah, the crying lady. Mm. Yeah, she she can find you if she sees your face. She comes out at night. Here at the mission. Uh, here, it's like she points out like uh, onto the street, and it's like, uh, it's like we've seen her, right? And she looks over at Lila, and she's like, shut up, don't say anything, don't say it out loud. And she's like, there's some things we can't talk about with the crying lady. Why? Did you talk with the crying lady? No, nobody. No, talks to the nobody crying talks lady. to the crying lady. Okay. Like, no, but you, if you talk, if you talk about her, like your best friend will die. Okay. And you've seen the crying lady. She nods. She, mm, yes. Okay. Have you seen her recently? When was the last time you saw the crying lady? Do you remember? 
Um, I saw her out a window one night. And it was dark. She was floating around. She was looking for somebody. She's always looking for somebody. She's always crying. And she's not here in the mission. She's outside. You see her in the street. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Has, has anyone else... Or has anyone come back from the crying lady? She shakes her head. No. It's okay. Sometimes we... I think we're safe here. I think the blue lady, I think she protects us. Blue lady. Okay. Who's the blue lady? She's a magical lady. She's smart. Really? Yeah. She helps kids like us sometimes. Okay. And you can she's, talk about her. She's cursed, though. Oh. What do you mean? She can only help kids when they call out her name. No mm. one knows that, though. I saw her once. She looked at me through the window. And she talked to me in my head. She kept saying to hold on. Hold on to what? She shrugs. Okay. All right. And I look at Lila's aura. Is it the same as Crystal's? Nope. Lila, have you seen the blue lady? No. Have you seen the crying lady? Roll a uh, roll notice. Notice. 23, baby. She's lying. Are you sure you haven't seen the blue lady and the crying no. lady, Layla? No. No. Okay, all right, all right. And her, and her horror is normal. Yep. All right, all right. Cool, all right. <laughs> well, you girls have been very nice, all right? So here you are, so I pull out, like, two $5 bills and I give like, <laughs> each one. And next time you go out with anyone from the mission, ask for ice cream, it's on me. Ice cream, yeah, thanks, thanks, mister. Like, All right, <laughs> thank you. She's like, I got, I, what did you get? What did you get? She, I got five, you know, like, like doing that. Uh, All right, so really? <laughs> I, I, um, I, I, I look for the nun. Yeah, you see Santiago's just finishing up the tour. Uh, with the rest of with everybody else so, in tow, he's bringing so it's you, Mrs. Like, Santiago, uh, Ms. Santiago, uh, Ms. Nun, so. Ms. Santiago, yes. Uh, I spoke to two very nice little girls out there, uh, Crystal and Layla. Oh, yes, and please, it's it's free. You can call me Frida, Frida. Thank you very much. Uh, what can you tell me about Crystal? How long has she been here? Why is she here? Uh, Crystal's been here for the better part of a year. Year and a half. Okay. Uh, those two are inseparable, by the way. So I'm pointing to Crystal and Lila. Okay. Um. Check your notes. They're sisters, you know. Those oh, two. they are biological sisters. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, they both came from the same broken home. Uh, they've got nowhere else really to go to. Uh, so we take care of them as best as we can here. Like and many of the other this, children. Do you have any information on the family? Uh, it's very sparse, but um, just sort of the usual unfortunate stories that we hear often here. Uh, you know, mother was into drugs, father disappeared, potentially criminal, potential criminal record. Uh, so when you say father disappeared, do we have any information on the father? No, nothing we've been privy to. Nothing at least that the, the police were willing to share with us that was pertinent. Do you by any chance have uh, a name, like father's name, first name, last name? Father? Uh, no, the father, name. like oh. Crystal. Uh, yeah, he gives you a name, like... Uh, uh, Daniel, whatever. 
Okay. Ah, uh, this might be. Uh, I, I do have another question. Um, does Rico? There was a child here named Rico that uh, they told me disappeared. Very recently, yes, in the last couple months. Can you tell me anything about that? Um, some of his friends were there with him, or or rather, they claim that the crying lady or some other nonsense um, claimed him um, but they weren't there when it occurred but they they when we asked them what had happened they said that uh, that this woman had seen his face and that she would be coming for him we tried to get in contact with Rico's family we th think maybe they were talking about his mother or some other guardian but uh, there is no contact there is the crying lady a reoccurring story among the children here? It is. It is a very prevalent. It's actually. It's the, the Miami Herald did a story about it a few years ago. As a matter of fact, the Miami it, Herald. Okay. Yes, um, there is a um, pervasive mythology uh, that affects these children, and Father Vega can probably speak to this better than I can. But uh, from our personal uh, experience and dealing with these children day in and day out, they oftentimes will, uh, from a psychological standpoint, create things, uh, these little mythologies that are interwoven with their own faith, the faith that they find here at the mission. And it, it's, it helps them cope, I suppose. Mm, coping mechanism, Gives some method yes. of hope, yes. Obviously, we try to do what we can to instill them with, you know, you know cogent morality, uh, something that uh, they can actually use in real life. Um, nonetheless, they still adhere to these uh, these notions. These All right. Mythological figures. They talk I about take a quick or... look. While she's talking, I take a quick look at my watch. What time is it? Uh, it's getting dark. Uh, it's probably like in the, like four or five o'clock in the afternoon in August, or rather fall, somewhere, sometime around fall. So uh, I guess it's starting to get dark. Uh, sister, this might look like it might sound like a strange question, but would it be possible for us to spend the night here? No, I'm afraid not. I'm sorry. All right. All right, not a problem. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time and your help. Uh, we will stay in touch. And uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Father Vega yes. mentioned uh, if there's any paperwork, um, any uh, forms that need to be signed, and it, we do require uh, some kind of a identification and records to be kept uh, on anybody who comes in and out of the property. So, all right, no uh, problem. And like she kind of like reaches into, excuse me, reaches into a satchel bag and like hands you like stacks of like documents. Like these all need to be filed out before you come back. And before we come like, back. I, yeah, basically they have to, you have to fill out this paperwork, give it to her, and they have to like process it and be like, okay, these people are not child predators or, mm. uh, you know, psychopaths, yep. <laughs> have like criminal records a mile long, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Well, we'll get back to you on that as soon as possible, sister. Of course. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much for your time. You're doing a great job. Great work here. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. I look at everybody. I'm like, Let's go. what do you do after that? Well, are we in a van? I don't remember. We have the station wagon. <laughs> yeah, station wagon. <laughs> the station wagon is outside yeah. on, the, on the alleyway. Mm -hmm. Do we all fit in the station wagon? Yeah. I mean, uncomfortably, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's the lowdown. There's a crying lady and a blue lady. <laughs> now, I don't know what we're dealing with yet, but the crying lady takes kids away, and the blue lady actually helps the kids. Now, we might be dealing with some weird-ass entities here, so we need to make some research in regards to that. Has anybody ever heard of anything similar to that, like a crying lady or anything? Like in whether you have, any type you of have folklore. A cult. If you I, have a cult, you can roll it. Cult. Uh, does my adept school count as a cult? No. <laughs> mm, really? You can roll knowledge if you don't have. Yeah, you don't have a. If you don't have a cult, you could use knowledge and you can get something out of that potentially. Otherwise, yeah, you need the some sort of skill to supplement. All right, so I'm going to do a knowledge roll. Okay. 
Roll percentile. Fif- Fifty-seven on sixty. Hey, that's pretty damn good. All right. Um, yeah, you've heard of uh, Lucy's. Definitely got it. You definitely got it. You both have heard of something that resembles what they're talking about, especially once you explain it that way to these people, like crying lady and stuff like that. You've both heard of of uh, local myths and legends, and it's it seems pretty eerie and pretty uh, telling that when they talk, when these children talk about the crying lady and they're talking about the local uh, folklore legend and in in Spanish, it's translated La Llorona. All right, that's what I thought. All right. That's all the time. And that's where we'll stop. No. (laughs) No. That's all the time we have for this session. I hope everyone here and those watching enjoyed the show. Continue our adventure into the occult underground next Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you enjoyed tonight's program, feel free to check out our other awesome adventures and terrifying tales. In the way of awesome adventures this week, on Tuesday, we have Squeaks in the Deep on the Onyx Path channel. Wednesdays brings us Deadlands Horror at Headstone Hill. And coming soon on Thursdays and Fridays, Star Trek Dauntless. And on Friday... This will debut the charity one-shots for Blue Rose and Extreme Meat Punks Forever run by Stone Fires and Voodoo Arcade, respectively. Coming soon to Saturday is also Mutant Year Zero and Fiasco in August on Sundays. On Mondays, we have They Came From Beyond the Grave. Check out Chronicles of Darkness's Mage the Awakening, Book 1, Defiance on Tuesdays. Alien the RPG, Acid and Ice on Thursdays. Coming soon on Fridays, Black Void, along uh, alongside Saturdays, where we're doing Simba Room, Heiress to Darkness, and Werewolf, Rite of Passage. And later this evening, we bring you the V20 Anniversary Chronicle, Starlight and Smoke. Don't forget to check out our, our tabletop titties on Fridays and Saturdays. They're a queer and feminist TCRPG podcast and streaming group run entirely by people of marginalized genders. For more information, visit tabletoptitties.com. And remember, every time we say titties, it's with double these. And now for those of you who stayed after the credits are rolled, it's time to vote for favorites. All players in this game can select another as their favorite for that session for any reason. Recipients get a reward in the form of a reroll for their character. For viewers, voting is open as well. You too can choose a new favorite each week for all shows. But you have to be quick. Voting ends the moment our reel finishes. So be sure to cast your votes in the Twitch chat as soon as you can. Beginning with uh, Key, who portrayed Lucius this afternoon. Who's your favorite and why? I gotta give my vote to Jace solely because I gave him a hard time with what his deal was. <laughs> What's your deal, man? <laughs> That's great. Two queens and a king. It sucked. <laughs> nice. Uh, Alan, who played uh, Damien this afternoon, who's your favorite? Why? I'm going to be giving my vote to Jesse slash Corey for even remotely have thought of creating a copy of Frank. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, John, who played Sean this, uh, this afternoon, who's your favorite? Uh, my favorite is also going to go to Jesse for just like the the amoral shenanigans that got going on with the, like all the copies, like, hey, make a copy of your son. Well, okay, well, let's make a copy of Frank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. Uh, Jace, uh, sorry, Mike, who played Jace? Uh, who's your favorite? Um, it's a tough call, but I'm, I'm going to actually also stick to Jesse because he had the guts to put aside that letter that was Gus's mm. and not say anything to anybody. And eventually give it back in front so Gus could see and give it back. That, that was pretty cool, actually. Yeah. That was really nice. A lot of well guts done. there. <laughs> uh, and of course, last but not least, uh, Cor- uh, Corey, who played Jesse. Who's your favorite and why? Uh, I think I got to go with uh, Sean for going along with the, uh, the conversation and the moral obligations of what does it mean to create a new person? Mm. Uh, Thank you. For any reason. <laughs> It's a, yeah. it's an interesting question because Jesse themselves being a creation really doesn't understand why it's wrong. So yeah. kind of needs the outside moral perspective, which is, so I love that. Right. I love that you're loving it. <laughs> nice. 
Excellent. Well, I've been Eric at Maroon Recluse on Twitter. You can find me here later tonight for Starlight and Smoke. Uh, big thanks, as always, to our patrons for supporting what we do. If you want to be awesome and do the same, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Tales and keep up to date on what we're doing throughout the month by checking in on the updated calendar on Tales.com. And thanks to you, our viewers and fans, for tuning in. As always, stay charged, never play a drinking game with a booze hound, and don't violate your taboos. Good night, everybody. <laughs>